B'Shem Hashem Na'aseh V'Natzliach Shil Torah, great to be in Miami again Haven't seen you guys in a long time, Baruch Hashem We have CD number two is out, lots of presents, different uh, things that will help us get closer to Hashem Now that we've said, I'm sorry to Hashem, give us another chance, give us another opportunity Judge us in the book of life, judge us with the tzaddikim, judge us with the nevonim, judge us with the greatest of great. Okay, so now we have to do something about it. We can't just say, give us everything and we don't do anything. We still stay the same thing like last year. We have to keep getting better. So, Be'ezot Hashem, we're going to learn a few things that are going to help us get better today. Uh, also, the Yashu uh, B'Refua Shlema to Michel Koto, Yoshua Mikael Ben Hadassa, Amparo Volufe, Luardes Garcia, Idil Magorero, Josefina Matos, Isabel Perez, Mirela Perez, Ruven Pablos, Jose Avila, Sara Bat Levana, Levana Bat Sara, David Ben Esria, Doris Bat Jora. May Hashem give them all Refua Shlema, Refuat Nefesh, Refuat Aguf. So, as you know, we started a uh, Pirkei Avot series. As uh, even though you know we've gone through the uh, entire five books of Moses so far, a uh, couple of times Baruch Hashem, and uh, we're starting to get to a point where we realize that okay, now that we know the basics of the story, we know that some parts of the uh, Musar that we can learn, the ethics that we can learn, the uh, mitzvot that we can learn from the five books of Moses, we have to get into deeper. Uh, ethical behavior and the reason why is because why we choose Musar versus let's say for example go, going over Alachot going over the laws of Judaism is because number one to learn the laws of Judaism there are countless places that you can do it there's many many rabbis teach Alachot there's many many books that teach Alachot you know you could read a book yourself you could watch Shulim if you look at the internet or you look at just overall Torah in general the overwhelming majority of teaching is about the laws, is about what you need to do. What we have very little of is how to be a Jew, how to behave, how to become what Hashem Bach calls Ben Adam, Adam, you know, someone, not just a son of man, but someone that represents an ethical person, whether man or woman, and someone that has fixed his midot, his character traits. And I see a lot of times where there are, unfortunately, sometimes you, you see people that have learned many alachot, they know all different types of laws, but they forgot how to behave like human beings. There's racism, sexism, uh, stinginess, uh, you know, anger, all types of flawed behavior traits that we need to talk about. So, Hashem had the sages put together a Mishnah, which they call Pirkei Avot. We have each one of the sages say different things, different ma'amarim, different sayings of what they did in their life for themselves, in essence, how they behaved, uh, and what's obviously commanded by the Torah to behave as such. And what could easily change your life if you could apply even one of all of these Mishnayot we're going to go over, even if you apply one of these Mishnayot, we're going to probably have this series is probably going to be over 100 Shulim. As I'm seeing right now, I thought that initially maybe we're going to go over two, three, or four Mishnayot each time. It seems like the pace that we're going, it's only one Mishnah per Shiur, um, because each one of them, if you really cover it, uh, it takes... Takes a, it takes a lot. It's a lot of, a lot of teaching. And even then, we don't, we're not that deep into it. So this is going to be a very intense lesson that is going to teach us each Mishnah and how it could apply to our life, whether it's to our business, to our family, to our just day-to-day -day life, and how we can make ourselves better people. Because knowing the story is great. Knowing where we came from is phenomenal. Knowing the mitzvot is obviously necessary. All of these things are important. But... If we do all of these mitzvot and we show the world an exterior that represents Judaism, but the interior is rotten, we're still angry all the time, 
we're still sad all the time, we're still depressed, we still have anxiety, we still have all types of bitterness, we're still cheap, and we have a hard time giving tzedakah or lending money to a friend. We still have all of these flawed character traits then according to the Gemara, according to the Oral Torah, our behavior traits is making all of our mitzvot look terrible. As it says, a Talmid Chacham, someone that knows a lot of Torah, someone that's a, considered a scholar, that has bad midot, that has bad character traits, a dead animal on a street is better than him. That's how important midot are. So the Vilna Gaon was asked, why is it that if character traits, character development is so important, why is it that it's not one of the 613 commandments, one of the 613 mitzvot that we have in the Torah? Why doesn't it say mitzvah number 614, fix your midot? Why is it a mitzvah of itself? And the Vilna Gaon, with his genius, answered very simply, he said, the point of all of these mitzvot is to make you a human being. The point of all of these alachot, all of these ways to connect to Hashem is to make you a structure that will keep you gated and protect you from yourself. Protect you from your own bad character traits. If you know every single day that you have to wake up, you have to say, Modani. What do you learn? First lesson you got out of, you, you just woke up. You just had tchiyat amitim. You had just the resurrection of the dead. You woke up, you're saying what? Saying thank you to Hashem. First thing you learn, gratitude. You have to be, you have to show gratitude. Somebody does something for you, whether it's a good job or a bad job, whether you like it, you don't like it, whether you asked for it, you didn't ask for it, be gracious. Say thank you. Thank you can buy you your next world. Just one simple thank you. After you do that, you go and you wash your hands and you say another blessing. Already you're learning that there's a structure. There's a structure to life. You have to have order in your life. You can't just be one of these people that wings it and just does whatever he wants. You wake up whenever you want. You go to sleep whenever you want. You go to work sometimes. You don't go to work sometimes. You say hello sometimes. You don't say hello sometimes. Everything is just like, you know, the wild, wild west. Can't do this. Already you realize that there's a structure of everything that you want to do. There's something has to take place before it. Then you wash your hands. So it teach you hygiene. You have to have hygiene. You can't be one of these guys that, uh, you know, wears all of these uh, fancy clothes, but you forgot to take a shower. So the rest of the world is suffering being next to you. Then it causes chilul Hashem. It doesn't cause, it's not kidush Hashem. You can wear all the black and white in the world, but if you're smelly, then it's chilul Hashem. People think that all Jews smell then. So people need to understand, okay, hygiene is very important too. Yeah, you are a servant and a representation of Hashem at all times. We are commanded to be a light to the nations, which means that at all moments, we have to be prepared to be at our best. This is also the reason why we just passed the uh, holiday of Simchat Torah, which is a fantastic holiday of celebration, but one of the things that unfortunately we fail at at times is that we forget ourselves. You know, Hashem tells us that we're supposed to celebrate, and sometimes we take it too far. Sometimes people, instead of just having a little bit of a drink, if they like that type of stuff, they like to the drink, they want to have a little bit of a drink to get a buzz and just get a good feeling, they drink a third of the bottle and show up to the miniature Bet Mikdash, called the Bet Knesset in our generation, like alcoholics. They smell of alcohol, they act like they're alcoholics, they fall all over each other, and what are they doing? They're doing it right next to the Sefer Torah. If this was the Bet Mikdash and the Sanhedrin was around, they would get the death penalty on the spot. On the spot, no, no, no trial. On the spot, they get death penalty. Yeah, well, the same thing happened with Aaron. No? Right, Aaron's kids. Two of Aaron's kids 
There's five reasons of why they say that they, uh, they got, Hashem killed them. One of the reasons is because they had a couple of drinks before they went to Kodesh Kodashim. You're not allowed to walk into shul drunk or even with too much alcohol. This leads me to my next issue that people have asked me about, but I never brought it in a shiur, so it's good to just mention and then go into the kavod, is the fact of why people always ask, are we allowed to smoke marijuana? Now, in the past, it was illegal in America. Now it's legal. Now it's advocated. Now it's celebrated. Now there is investment seminars specifically made for investing in marijuana companies. Mm -hmm. So little by little we see that Sodom and Gomorrah is becoming America. Or America is becoming Sodom and Gomorrah. But nonetheless, people are investing in marijuana. People are building these multi-billion dollar industry that just a few uh, year, years ago was illegal. And people would go to jail for it and get murdered for it. Now it's celebrated. Why? Because it is tax money. We can make some money off of it. You see how quickly we sell our soul for money. All of a sudden, all of those feelings we had about how it's not good and how it kills brain cells and how it's not appropriate and so on and so forth, all of those ethical things that people said is the reason why it's illegal for all these years, all of a sudden, we forgot about them. Why? Ah, it's legal now. It's legal in Colorado. It's legal in California. It's legal here. It's legal there. Go ahead. So, you know. so now if you see somebody with their eyes red, you don't ask, what's wrong? It's like, ah, you had a cupcake from uh, so-and-so wheat seller? It's chazaku baruch. They give you, you know, a blessing somebody like that. Ah, it's, it's better than smoking, right? You know, and it's, it, it's celebrated. So this is not allowed in Judaism. And the reason why it's not allowed, unless it's for medicinal reasons, unless it's legitimately for medicinal reasons, which 90, at least 90% of people that smoke weed or have any type of marijuana product are not doing it for medicinal reasons. They're able to get it because some doctor sold his soul and gave them a fake card and told them, listen, you could use this medical card to go get your weed because you're an addict but not really because they have real medical problems. There's no way that every 18 to 25 year old in America has medical problems to give them a uh, medical card now. But people want to believe their own lies. And nonetheless, unless it's truly for medicinal reasons, meaning someone has cancer, they suffer from major pain. Someone has AIDS, they suffer from major pain. Someone has some type of major disease that causes him serious, serious pain. So yes, you can use marijuana for different reasons that it's going to help you with your pain. And it's not really effective at all times, by the way. It's not effective for everyone. Not everyone benefits out of it. But nonetheless, if it helps you, yes, you can use it for that. There's no question, there's no problem. But the reality of it is that 90% of the people do not have medical problems and they're smoking it purely for pleasure because they want to leave reality. There's a reality, and then there's everything that else that's out there. They don't want reality. They want to be somewhere else. They want to think somewhere else. They want to feel somewhere else. They're not happy with their present state of mind. So they want to create an illusion. This is not allowed. And the reason why it's not allowed is the ver for the very same reason of why we're not allowed to drink and become uh, uh, alcoholics or even drunk, especially if we go to Beknesset, because a Jew is commanded to be a light to the nations. But by being a light to the nations, it means that you have to know that not only are you representing yourself as a Jew in front of people, you're representing God. But that also means that you have to be ready at all times to meet God, to meet your maker. <coughs> at all times, you have to be prepared for if... Hashem uncovered himself and showed himself to you, you're prepared at that moment. You look and act appropriate at that moment, especially in the Beknesset. Now, if you're drunk, 
It's not exactly the best way to show up to you, meet your maker. Leavdil, but if you were going to meet uh, your new boss, or you're going to meet one of the uh, new presidents, or one of these new governors, or somebody of importance, you're not going to show up drunk, at least if you have any sense in you. At least if you have any self-respect, you're not going to show up drunk. You're not going to show up high. Oh yeah, I just had a brownie. You're not going to do that. Why? Because you know it's just not appropriate. It's not the way you do it. So why is it appropriate to do it next to God? Because you don't see Him? Just pay attention. You'll see Him everywhere. So as far as smoking weed, eating marijuana, anything that gets you out of your state of mind is not allowed. So someone asked me the other day, well, what about coffee? Coffee also changes your state of mind. That's not necessarily the same level of changing your state of mind. First and foremost, you have to, uh, you know, most people that drink coffee are normal human beings that have one cup of coffee in the morning to wake them up. Not 17 cups of coffee to get them to a point where they're like hysterical maniacs. So assuming you drink coffee like a normal human being, doesn't really change your state of mind, just wakes you up. If anything, it helps you with your prayers and you're not falling asleep with your tefillin on. Oh, and, and even the, in the, in the Sha'arit, they tell you to drink water or coffee. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. There's no question, there's no problem. No, yeah, there's no, no, no problem with it. There's no problem with it. It's just to, it's to make you more alert. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change your state of mind. It makes you more, you know, makes you awake or it could make you awake. For me, it doesn't really affect me at all. Uh, most things don't affect me. I have a strange body of one of these bodies that you have to donate to science one day and <laughs> see what's going on. But uh, some people, this stuff affects them. You know, Red Bull and coffee and all, all these types of things, it's fine. So it's not the same level of, of uh, you know, you'll have a cup of coffee and go meet president, uh, whoever is going to be the winner in a, in a week. But you're not going to have a, a quick joint next to this president. Right? You're not going to have a, uh, a nice shot of uh, tequila right next to this president. But you can have a cup of coffee in your hand. Right? Why? Because it's, it's acceptable. It's acceptable behavior. So if it's acceptable behavior, then obviously you have to realize if it's acceptable behavior for a lowly king of flesh and blood, then it'll be acceptable for the king of kings. If it's not acceptable for them, then it's not acceptable for the king of kings, obviously, even more so. So that's the main thing in regards to answering the question about weed and uh, alcohol. It's very, very imp important for people to know that it's not just appropriate behavior, it's also that the judgment is very, very dear. And a lot of people have a tough time with some of the parts, have a tough time believing some of the things we say in regards to the judgment because we're one of very few people that actually talk about judgment uh, publicly. So. I brought a couple of sources. I just, you know, I just went over recently, and uh, the Gemara. This is countless sources. This is a couple of them, so you understand that what we're saying, it's not my opinion. Chas v'shalom. It's not my my opinion. Is not even worth one letter. Any letter you pick in the entire Torah, it's not worth that one. My opinion. So no one can ever think. Listen, this guy is a machmil. He's a stringent guy. It's not my. If it's stringency, then it's my opinion. I'm telling you, everything I'm saying to you is standard, basic level. Even though the basic level seems like it's a stringency for everyone else, that's not what the Torah says. The Torah says this is basic. So when we talk about punishment, when we talk about the hand of God being involved in our day-to-day -day life and being gracious and merciful in good times when we're serving Him, but also being judgmental when we're not. It's not an opinion. It is written. So to give you an understanding, so each one of these sages that's mentioned by name in the Gemara meant that he was at least at the level of reviving the dead. Meaning, there was many people in New Torah, many people in New Torah, but oh Hashem, in those days there was really very few people that were not religious. If someone was not religious, usually they were just a kofir, they were a heretic, they went against the religions. Either you were really religious, a tzaddik, or you were a heretic. But, you know, it wasn't like a secular neighborhood. There was no such thing. There was no 
people walk, you know, spending uh, their time going to the movies together or uh, playing uh, Pokemon. It's either you were religious or you were a heretic. So anyone that learned Torah doesn't necessarily mean that he got to high levels. But the ones that got to really high levels became Talmidim Chachamim. But then there were people that were considered Tanaim or Amoraim, the sages, that some of them mentioned things that contributed to the Torah. But then there's ones that are even higher than the standard that if you just contributed to the Torah, but you weren't the highest level, then it would just say, someone said so-and-so. But if they mentioned you by name, that means you're a big deal. It means you are written in stone here. You're written in the Torah for eternity. For eternity, your name is going to be known. So that means you have to be a big deal, not just a righteous person. You have to be something that's not human for our generation. So here you have Rabbi Lazar. Rabbi Lazar was one of the major sages. And every time he came to this particular verse in the book of Genesis, chapter 45.3, where it says, But his brothers could not answer him, for they were astounded before him. This verse, if you remember, is from the story of Joseph and his brothers, where his brothers thought that he died after they sold him or he was somewhere, they didn't know that he turned into this viceroy, the very same viceroy that's controlling Egypt, controlling the food, controlling pretty much everything, and is also controlling their destiny at that very moment because he's the one that's going to decide whether they're going to live or die, whether there's going to be a war or there's going to be peace. So when he uncovered his face and he told them, I am your brother, is my father still alive? They suddenly realized that this brother they sold two decades ago is still alive and well and actually better than ever. And they had through prophecy, Hashem showed them the whole picture. And they saw everything that they did, and they immediately felt sorry. But not sorry like, hey, listen, I bumped into you, I'm sorry. Hey, listen, I uh, forgot to uh, bring the money that I owe you, I'm sorry. Hey, listen, I can't pay you back, I'm sorry. Not that level of sorry. The level of sorry that Hashem and Hashem, when someone gets to Shemaim, and the judgment day is in front of him, and they show him the movie of his entire life. Everything he's done from the moment he was born until he arrived. They show him the entire movie and they say, Why did you sin there? 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 Every single sin. Every single time you said, Lashonara. Every single time you forgot to say a blessing and say thank you to Hashem. Every single time you played on your phone, just chas shalom, you're going to miss the updates on Shabbat for the elections. Every single time you decide not to listen to the rabbi. Every single time you decide, you know what, today, I don't feel like being modest. I want to show off to my friends to show them that I look good still. Every time you went against the Shem, they're going to show you every time. And anyone that has had a near-death experience will tell you that the worst possible thing that they experienced in that world is the busha is the shame. The shame that now that they know the truth, they know that Hashem Yitbach is 100% emet, there's no, there's nothing separating them from Hashem. They know everything in the Torah is real. They know everything about Hashem is real. It's much more transparent than we could even imagine. And on top of it, they see how they acted for the last 30, 40, or 50 years. And the level of shame that they have, they say, is you only, wanting to die is not enough. You just want to cease to exist. You don't want to exist. That's how the level of Bushah that you have. And that's the level of Bushah that the 12 tribes had here. 
the shame they had of what they did to their brother. So Rabbi el says, every time I read this verse, I cry. Why does he cry? Now, if this is the rebuke of flesh and blood that causes so much consternation, the rebuke of the Holy One, blessed is He, will be all the more. If the brothers of Yosef and Sadiq felt such horror, such shame in front of a human being, imagine the shame we're going to feel in front of Melech Malchei Amlachim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when we know the full picture. So this is something that, again, people don't think about it, but it's nonetheless a very, very big part of the, of the punishment. Another interesting thing that, you know, when we talk about some things, we're not obviously going to talk about details of it, but just to give you guys a little bit of an idea that I want to bring up a couple of these points with Siyat Gishmaya that really eliminate these naysayers or anything that you may or may not hear from other places where they tell you, no, it's too harsh, Gehenom doesn't exist, it's only one year. And, you know, they, people, there's a whole, there's a, actually a Chabad article that was written a few years ago, unfortunately, that after it was written, the way it was written was a complete, complete kfira, complete heresy by a big organization, a respectable organization, which I know that if their Rebbe was still alive, he would not only not allow this article to be written, but he would probably make sure that this person that wrote the article will be housed in a, in a, in a room and not allowed to go out until he knows the truth. Because someone asked, does Judaism believe in Gan Eden and Gainom? Someone asked this question, if Judaism believes in Gainom, and the way that this person wrote this article, he made it seem like Gehenom was not only not really such a bad place, in some extent it actually seemed like it was good. That's how he defined Gehenom. Now there is no book and there's no sources for such craziness. Even the Goyim know that Gehenom is not a good place. And uh, no big deal. By definition, everyone knows that Genom is not a... We mentioned Genom, somebody gets... Satan has to interfere. <laughs> it's like, hey, what are you talking about my house for? <laughs> so, this guy made it seem, which is a common description of it, where they say, no, it's like a washing machine. You know, it's a... Uh, you go there for a year, they clean you up, and then you go to Gan Eden. This is complete nonsense. There's no source whatsoever for what, what, what's stated over there. And there's a major confusion about this whole thing about it being one year. First of all, there's no such thing. It could be infinite amount of years. There's actually Gemara, Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 17, says that certain people that go to Gehenom never leave. Mashiach will come, the world would end, but their, their Gehenom will never end. So there's, there's actual Gemara, oral Torah, that is specifically saying the opposite. But... More so than that, it's, they make it seem like it's not such a bad place. And it's important for us to know these things because this Mishnah we're going to learn today, part of it is to understand what Yirat Shamaim is. So here in this Gemara, Masechet Chagiyah, it says, and it's likewise so with respect to the measure of punishment, for it is written, Bemisparayamim asher tartem et ha'aretz like the number of the days that you spied out the land. Now did they in fact sin for 40 years, but they sinned for only 40 days. Rather this to teach us the following teaching, anyone who commits a transgression, even one day in the year, scripture considers it against him as if he transgressed the entire year. So this they're using a source. This is Masechet Chagigah, page 5b. This here they're teaching Something that is very, very scary. Scary than even the description of Ganom. 
What's the scary part here? What, what are they trying to scare the daylight out of us with this? They're using the sin of the spies that we learned about with Moshe Rabbeinu, where they said, listen, the spies, they went to Canaan, which is later to be called Eretz Yisrael, for 40 days. They reported bad news about it. And then Hashem punished us for 40 years. Chazal is here to teach us that if someone makes a sin, they shouldn't think it's, oh, okay, I made a sin. It's not really that big of a deal. He says that some sins, you could be sinned for one day of sin, you could be punished for a year. So this, why am I mentioning this particular Gemara? Because sometimes we mention in Shurim that there are, parts of, there are parts of punishment that are not just a year or five years. It could be 5,000 years. It could be 50 million years. There's no concept of time in such a place. So people are saying, wait a minute, how could it be 50 million years if the world is only less than 6,000 years old? Number one, there's no concept of time over there because there's no matter. But number two, it specifically says in the Gemara, you could be punished for one sin for, you know, that's one day for a whole year. So the point being here is that when someone is going to state their opinion publicly, whether it's in an article or a lecture or even just behavior in general in the Bet Knesset, they have to realize that they are responsible for everything that they do. You're, as a Jew, you're responsible for every single one of your actions. And if you're not going to be a light to the nations, make sure you're not a darkness to it either. Make sure you're not representing Judaism in a bad way. And this is one of the main things we learned from Pirkei Avot, because each and every one of these tools is going to teach us how to become better human beings. The, um, we went over a little bit of the parasha last night, but one of the things that we learned when there is no control from Parashat Noach, is, you know, in essence, in Parashat Noach, the people of that generation had everything. They were very, very wealthy. They had, the world was drastically more beautiful. They had all types of things that are beyond our imagination. They were big, they were strong, they were wealthy. They had everything and anything that they could possibly desire. But they were no longer able to control themselves. And mankind started doing things against Hashem, against the rules that God dictated, whether it's men with men, like it's socially acceptable today, or it's with animals, or it's stealing each other's wives, or it's all types of things that are mamash like crazy, but became normal to them, and unfortunately we see slowly but surely is becoming normal today. And from Parashat Noach, we realize and we learn that the mitzvah of not wasting seed is first mentioned in this parasha. If anyone remembers the, uh, the three-hour lecture that I uh, had in New York about wasting seed, the first source that's mentioned in the Torah of not to waste seed, this is actually one of the mitzvot that is mentioned after the Mabul. In chapter 9, verse 6, after Hashem destroyed the world, because these people were not able to control themselves, because they were stealing from each other, raping each other, and doing everything against mankind's benefit, Hashem decides to, unfortunately, for them, destroy the world and start over with Noah. And after destroying the world and putting the globe on a major trauma that aged the world an extraordinary amount, he tells Noah, listen, you're going to start the world with your family. This is the 
opportunity you have to recreate the world. But know that in order for me not to, you know, I'm not going to destroy the world again, but you have to comply with some basic laws that are going to apply to mankind forever. And he gives him the seven laws of Noah. Now, Chazal says that the first six were already around. Were already there before the Mabul. Hashem gave the first six to Adam Arishon, to, to Adam. But he gave the seventh one to Noah. And that's why it's called by the name of Noah. Noahide laws. But one of the laws is do not murder. Do not murder, which is a very logical law. This is the reason why, you know, all seven laws, all seven Noahide laws are very logical, which is the reason why when a, according to the Torah, when a Noahide violates one of these seven laws, their punishment is always a death penalty. It's not like in Judaism where there's different punishments. So for example, if a Jew steals and is caught without admitting that he stole, he has to pay double. If he stole 100, he has to pay 200. If he stole 200, he has to pay 400. But a Noahide, a non-Jew that stole, according to the Torah, even if he stole a dollar, the punishment is a death penalty. So this is, this is a reason why, is because number one, they have much fewer number of rules than the Jews. And number two, all of their rules are very basic logic in order for you to have a civilized world. So one of the laws that Hashem gives Noah is that, listen, do not murder. But the way that he gives it is very different than the way it's mentioned in the rest of the Torah, including the Ten Commandments. If you look at the Ten Commandments of when Hashem says, do not murder, it says, lo tirzach, two words. But here in Parashat Noach, it's very clear that it's more than just do not murder. In chapter 9, verse 6, it says, shofech dam adam ba'adam, Whoever sheds the blood of man within the man, his blood will be spilled. Because in the image of God, Hashem made him. Hashem made man. So here we see this is not just a simple do not murder. This is whoever spills the blood of man within the man, his blood will be spilled. So we already know his blood will be spilled, that's the punishment. That means that somebody murders, his, his punishment is death penalty. But it starts here different. It says if you, the blood of a man within a man, if it just meant pure murder, then it would be the blood of a man. Anyone that spills the blood of a man, that's it, that's murder. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say anyone that spills the blood of a man. It says anyone that splits the blood of a man within a man. Dam Adam Badam. The blood of a man within a man. What's the blood of a man within a man? That's his seed. That's his seed. That's his sperm. So here we find the first literal source in the Torah about wasting seed. Now we're not going to have a whole wasting seed shiur, but Hashem, we've already put about four and a half, five hours into it in other lectures. But the point I'm trying to make here is that what is really the foundational reason of why people waste seed and why Hashem cares about it here specifically at the beginning of the Torah? In essence, the beginning of the new world. Because Noah started the new world again. This is not the same world that Adam had. That world was created. Was created and destroyed. This is a whole new world. He's starting from scratch. The reason why Hashem, according to the Zohar Kadosh, destroyed the world primarily was because of wasting seed. When mankind lost the value of life, the appreciation for the value of life, to the point where they would waste their seed and kill millions of souls, of potential souls, each and every single time, they lost their right to live. And Hashem is specifically mentioning this to Noah to know that whether you are a righteous Gentile or you are a Jew that's obligated to be a light to the nations, you're obligated by this mitzvah. And you cannot treat these potential souls like it's nothing. 
Now, the main reason of why this sin happens, which is the point of what I'm trying to get to, is when mankind has no structure, has no Yirat Shamaim, it's impossible for them to have control. When you don't think that someone's watching everything that you're doing, whether it's Netilat Yidayim, or if you do a blessing on the cookie, or if you're learning Torah, or if you're modest, or if you keep Shabbat, or if you do anything, big or small. If you don't think someone's watching every single business transaction that you're making, and I'm not talking about the government. If you don't think that someone's watching every single time, you think to yourself, do I give tzedakah or do I not give tzedakah? Do I make the blessing or do I not make the blessing? Do I go to shul or do I not go to shul? If you don't think someone's watching, then you've made yourself your own God. Because there has to be a God. There has to be a master of the world. Even if it's you yourself you're saying, there has to be someone in control of everything. If you're saying there's no God, chas v'shalom, but if you're saying that, that means you're the master of your own world, which means that you've made yourself into your own idol. And at that point, if you're your own idol, if you have no yirat shamayim, you have no fear of the Almighty that's watching you at all times, then it's very easy to lose control. It's very easy to start acting and doing everything according to your desires. And Hashem is telling you that from your simple lack of Yirat Shamaim, your simple lack of appreciation, not even saying Modani in the morning, you could easily get to a point of making one of the worst sins in the Torah, which is committing murder of hundreds of millions of souls on a daily basis. Now, this control is something that's not easy to attain after we are tainted with the immodesty of the world. But it's not impossible either. It's very few things that someone needs to do. Sometimes someone is trying to, obviously he's not doing it intentionally anymore. Baruch Hashem, they watch the shiurim, they're scared, they're looking to do tshuva, they stop. But they still have some things that they're not uh, in control over. Like for example, when they go to sleep. So there's a few things that someone needs to do. First and foremost, obviously, the most important beginning stage is you have to watch your eyes. If you watch immodesty, whether it's live, you know, in the world that you live around, if every time you see a woman, you're like one of these, you know, uh, toys you buy at the baseball games with the bobbleheads. You look at everything that walks. You go into waste seed. Whether intentionally or not intentionally, you look at you look at women. Even if you're looking at modest women. If every time, every time a woman moves, if she's modest or not modest, if you look at every single woman or a lot of women, you're going to waste seed. Your imagination is going to do its thing. You're going to imagine the modest woman that you're seeing at the Bet Knesset like the immodest woman you saw before you did tshuva. So first and foremost, you have to start watching your eyes. Start getting used to looking at the floor. Start getting used to training yourself that every time you see a woman, you see what you need to see, which is saying hello if you need to say hello, and then looking away or looking into nothing. Sometimes I can look straight at you. This is Baruch Hashem, takes some time, but I can look straight at you, but I'm not really looking at you. I'm looking, you see me as looking at you, but I'm really looking on top of your head or on the side of your head. I'm not really looking at your face. And that's necessary not for men, it's necessary for women, because sometimes I can't really look at them. So, now if I looked at the floor every single time, people were like, is there something wrong with you? Are you looking for something? Did you lose keys? What happened? So you have to train yourself. So first and foremost, you have to train your eyes. And it's not easy, but it's possible. Number one. Two, you have to make sure that you're not one of these people that curses every two seconds. You have to start watching your mouth. If you speak like a truck driver, this one level of immodesty leads to another. Step number three, you have to make sure that you're not putting yourself at risk at all times. If your surroundings are constantly immodest places, you're going to have an impossible time being modest. Whether it's a, because you, your meetings uh, always have to take a place at a bar. You know, there's a lot of networking events that happen in bars. 
or different gatherings where pretty much, you know, everyone shows up half naked on the female side and three piece suits on the male side. Each one is trying to dress to impress, hoping that they bring someone home instead of the business. You have to stay away from stuff like that. Someone wants to meet you, meet them at a coffee shop. Meet them at your office. You don't need to go to those places. You don't need to go there. There's plenty of ways you can make business without necessarily putting yourself in a place that's full of immodesty. I understand people think, oh wait, but maybe I'm gonna lose an opportunity. Well, yeah, if you don't believe in God, then yes, you'll lose an opportunity. But if you believe in God, then God knows that you're not going there, not because you don't want the business. You're not going there because you don't want to see immodest women. So I'll give you the business other ways. If you believe God runs the world, you have nothing to worry about. So watching your eyes, watching your surroundings, watching your mouth, and last but not least, choosing your friends. If all of your friends are lifetimes away from you, where they're idea of fun is going to strip clubs and bars which you used to do before you went to do, went uh, and did tshuva then you have to lose those friends or get them to do tshuva whichever happens first if you can't get them to do tshuva you have to lose your friends eventually the stronger your tshuva is the more that relationship is going to lose its meaning because you're going to have less and less in common so the point of all of this is to understand that Hashem is telling us here this one of the first seven mitzvot that we've gotten in the world is a critical mitzvah. Don't waste seed. You learn it from Noah. I destroyed the world because of this. But the only reason why it got to such a high level sin is because people could not control themselves. A very, very simple thing to do if you start with the right foot. If you teach your kids from the beginning, from when they're three and four and five and six years old, that they have to have structure, they have to say thank you, they have to wash their hands, they have to keep their hygiene, they have to pray, they have to study, they have to do all these different, if you teach them structure, but with a meaning, that you're doing it for something, you're doing it for someone, you're doing it for Hashem, you're not doing it because you're, you know, there's just, you want to read books for no reason. There's a reason for all of it. Then you're giving yourself a structure and Bezat Hashem, you won't get to such a high level sin. But if there's no structure and if you're just doing it for, you know, pretty much just because somebody told you to do it and you don't get your, ans your questions answered, eventually you're going to fall off and Hashem Yerachem, what can happen? So, so far we've learned the first couple of Mishnayot and we see that in the first Mishnah, we got the lineage and the history of where the Torah came from as it started from Mount Sinai. Hashem Barach gave the Torah to Moses, who gave it to Joshua, who gave it to the elders, who gave it to the prophets, who gave it to Anshek Nesed Agdolah, the, great, the men of the great assembly. And then the last member of of uh, Knesset Agdola was Shimon Tzadik, and we learned about him last night about how he said that the world is based on three things or standing on three things: Torah, the service of God, and upon loving kindness. And the history lesson continues with the Musar within it. Shimon Tzadik had many students, and here you have one of the people that got the teachings from Shimon HaTzadik, as it says, Antignos ish socho kibel mi Shimon HaTzadik, ua ya omer, al tiyu ka'avadim ha'mashamshin et arav al menat lekabel pras, ela hevu ka'avadim ha'mashamshin et arav shelo al menat lekabel pras, vii mora shamayim alechem. Antignos, leader of socho, received the tradition from Shimon the Righteous, Shimon the Tzaddik. He was accustomed to say, Be not as servants who serve the Master for the sake of receiving even a token reward, but rather like servants who serve the Master not for the sake of receiving a token reward, and nonetheless the fear of heaven should be upon you. 
So first and foremost, we realize that Antigo, uh, Antignos is not just a regular average Joe. When it says, the Chazal says that any anytime someone is mentioned, uh, is named in the Mishnah Avot as Ish, he is it's a, the most important person in that place. So he was the leader of Soho. And he received his teachings from Shimon HaTzadik. The greatest teacher of his time. And he was accustomed to say, and we learned yesterday that anytime it says, he was accustomed to say, it really means he was. Meaning he lived by these rules. He didn't just teach them. As the Gemara says, someone who teaches something but does something else, it's better that he would choke inside his mother's belly and never come to the world. Being a hypocrite is not acceptable in Judaism. And this is why we, if someone that's Torah observant, it would be impossible for them to be a good politician. So, Antigonos is saying, there's a few lessons here. Be not as servants who serve the master for the sake of receiving even a token reward. He's saying, listen, all of us are avadim for Hashem anyway. All of us are servants of Hashem. Whether you like it or not, it's Hashem's world. It's not your world. You don't run the show. You don't really decide anything. You don't decide whether you're going to come to life. You don't decide whether you're going to live or die. You don't decide whether you're male or female. You don't decide if you're rich or poor. You don't really decide anything. The only thing you decide is whether you're going to have Yirat Shamayim or not. Everything is from Shamayim. Everything is from heaven except the fear of heaven. Meaning that the only thing that you can decide is whether you're going to be righteous or not. Whether you're going to listen to the Torah and comply with it or not. So first and foremost, realize that this is Hashem's world. Now you can serve Hashem in one of two ways. You can serve Him only because you want a reward. You're doing it because there's going to be a reward at the end. Or He's telling you, you could serve Him not because of the reward. Now of course, there's nothing wrong with serving Hashem because we're going to get a reward. It says in Parashat Bechukotai, the first uh, ten, there's ten blessings before the curses. There's ten verses of blessings. All these different blessings that someone who serves Hashem is going to get. They're going to have children. They're going to have wealth. They're going to, their enemies are going to die. And so on and so forth. Different types of blessings that someone is going to receive for serving Hashem. But before we get into that, Let's have a little bit of an understanding of what a true understanding of your position in the world really means. The Chafetz Chaim was once overheard making a cheshbon nefesh, a accounting with God. Some one of the students overheard him. And he said, dear God, let's calculate what have you done for me and what have I done for you. You've given me the privilege of writing the very famous book, Mishnah Bura, the Chafetz Chaim, the Shmirat HaLashon, the Lekutei HaLachot, and many, many other Sfarim. Chafetz Chaim's books are life-changing. And what have I done for you? Nothing. Please, dear God, give me the opportunity to do something for you. Now us, if we write a chidush, forget a chidush, if we write just what it says, we go to the we write what the, what the rabbi said. Or not only that, we just remember it. Oh, I remember it. Or not only that, we just listen to it. We listen to the Torah. Somebody says something, we listen to it, we already think what's tzadikim. Hashem, look what I did for you. Look, I listened to the Torah. Hashem, I opened the book today, I studied for 15 minutes for you. Like, <laughs> that's the difference. The Chafet Saim wrote books, books that are changing lives, changing destinies, changing eternity. 
And he's saying all of this was for me, it wasn't, wasn't, I benefited, not Hashem. Everything that I did, everything that was, was done, Hashem did for me. He gave me the insight to write these books. He gave me the ideas. He gave me the body that it's able to write, the eyes that are able to see, the hand that's able to write, the brain that's able to think, the neshama that's able to breathe and operate. All of that Hashem did for me. I didn't do it for him. I only benefited out of it. He didn't benefit one bit. Hashem is perfect. This is a holy neshama that has holy thoughts. This is da Torah. This is the mindset of Torah. When we look at life that way, <coughs> where we see that the way we view things is a little bit wrong. Like people constantly ask me, listen, when is Hashem going to make such and such work out for me? Make the deal work out for me? Make me find a zivug? Uh, give me more panasa? Give me children? Give me this? Give me that? When is Hashem going to finally give me? They have a little bit of a misunderstanding of the relationship because number one they're completely not appreciating what they already have because if you're saying when is he going to give me that means that what you have is not enough the eyes you had are not enough the ears that can hear are not enough the air you breathe is not enough the food you eat is not enough. The wife you have is not enough. The husband you have is not enough. The job you have is not enough. Everything is not enough. So Hashem is not giving you enough. And on top of that, you're acting like He owes it to you, which is even worse. You're looking at the world in a very, very wrong state of mind where you think that Hashem owes you anything. So the Mishnah starts with a very, very important word where He's telling us, listen, remember, you're Avadim. You are servants of Hashem. You're here to serve Him. He's not here to serve you. And that is a very, very important state of mind that we need to get to. You can't get there overnight, obviously. It's, but it's something you have to train yourself. The next time you're about to ask Hashem for something, next time you want to ask Him for something, Hashem, give me Panasa, give me Zivu, give me this, give me this, give me this. One suggestion. Remember I told you guys that it's uh, maybe this shoe or a different shoe that a uh, good idea to get blessings and to uh, really connect to Hashem is by making time every day to thank Hashem. Every day, every, every day is, oh, take a minute, take 30 seconds, take 5 minutes, however much time you want to have, thank Hashem for something or a bunch of things, whatever you want to thank Him for. So good idea is before you ask Hashem for something, ask Him for anything, say thank you first. Why? Just think about it this way. If a father has two sons, and one son really, really loves him and appreciates the father unbelievably well, the other son, not so appreciative. Not so appreciative. Who does his father want to give more to? The one that says, thank you, Abba, I really, really appreciate it. I know that you would want to give me even more, but this is what I have and I appreciate it. Thank you, Abba, even if you can't give me, I know that you want to give me. Thank you, Abba, for whatever you're even thinking of giving me or you already gave me or what you gave me in the past. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the other one is like this generation's attitude, which is, that's it? That's it? <laughs> you, you give them their salary, you give them their present, you give them their whatever. Oh, that's it? It's a constant level of disappointment. Have you ever met anybody in this generation that's not constantly disappointed? Do you get a car? Oh, that's it? What do you mean, that's it? It's a brand new car. It's a car. I actually saw a video one time. This is really much like... It's like a something unbelievable. 
they took a video of these parents, you know, middle class parents, bought their, I don't know, 17, 18 year old kid a car. Bought him a car. But it wasn't, obviously, a 17, 18 year old is just starting to drive. So you're not going to buy him a brand new car if you're a smart parent. If, you're, if you buy him a brand new car, you're an idiot. Even if you're a uh, you know, rich person, there's really no need to buy him a brand new car because he's going to ruin it. He doesn't know how to drive. He's going to ruin it. And this is just a waste of money. So buy him some basic level car. It doesn't necessarily need to be a, uh, you know, uh, a three-wheeled car, but you know, it could be a basic level car. So anyway, so they buy him a standard used car. He sees the car and he starts screaming at his parents and cursing them and then he takes, I don't know, some type of like broom or something and starts smashing the car. Of how this is not the car he wanted. He wanted a brand new car. This is this generation. But sometimes this is us. With Hashem, though. He gives us everything, but we're forgetting about it. We don't want what he, what he gave us. We're smashing it. No, 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 Hashem, Hashem, I want the other one. I want the other one. But I gave you a wife already. Yeah, but I want the other one. She's uh, younger and she has longer hair. Yeah, but I gave you kids. Yeah, but I don't want them anymore. I want uh, a dog instead. But I gave you a job. Yeah, but I want to be a millionaire. I'm not a millionaire yet. Yeah, but you are a millionaire. No, no, I want to be like Bill Gates. I want to be like this one. Everything he gives us, it's always not enough. What are we saying? That's it? That's it? And this is part of the nature of man. His is, is evil inclination will always tell him to want more. Gemara says, give a man 100, he wants 200. Give him 200, he wants 400. Meaning that he'll never ever have enough. Unless he realizes where it's coming from, really. And what's the point of all of it? If he has a connection with Hashem, that he can control that desire. He can control that desire. But it takes work. If someone is not going to control his desire for material, then he'll never have enough. He'll always say, that's it. He'll always be unfulfilled. So, first and most important thing is to understand is that if... We're going to start becoming, getting to the habit of thanking Hashem first and then asking for something. You can ask as much as you want, but first thank Him. Be appreciative of what we already have. You're already a better servant. You're already showing that you realize the order and who comes first, who comes second. You already realize there's a structure. But now He's telling you Yes, it says that there's going to be many blessings, as it says in the book of uh, Parashat Bechukotai, and also in Parashat Kitavo. There's many, many blessings that mankind gets for serving Hashem. But he says, don't be one of those people that only serves Hashem because you're going to get an award. Be one of these people that serves them, not for the sake of the award. Now this is a very, very high level of serving Hashem. So why does he, st and then after that he says, nonetheless, fear, fear Hashem, which is a lower level. So here, first of all, he's telling you, you should really, ideally, you should serve Hashem like Avram Avinu, like Yitzchak Avinu, like Yaakov Avinu, like Moshe Rabbeinu, like Aaron Cohen, like David Amelech, like these great, extraordinary forefathers that we have, these perfect human beings who wanted nothing other than to connect to Hashem. He says, serve him like that. Job, the prophet Job says, even if I knew that Hashem was going to kill me and destroy me, I'd still serve him. I'd still serve him. Gemara, Masechet, uh, I believe it's Masechet Sota, or it may be Bitsa, but in the Gemara it says, there's a machloket. 
Did Job serve Hashem purely out of fear or purely out of love? If it was fear, it was the highest level of fear. If it was love, it was also a high level of love. Why a highest level of fear? Because the highest level of fear of Hashem is fear of a disconnect, not fear of a punishment. Fear of punishment is the lowest level of serving Hashem. You do the mitzvot, you fulfill the commandments. Why? Because you don't want to get punished. You don't want to lose money. You don't want to get divorced, chas v'shalom. You don't want to lose any children. You don't want to go to Gainom. You don't want all these bad things that we talk about from time to time. You don't want all those bad things to happen to you. So that's why you do it. That's the lowest level of serving Hashem. It's still good, it's respectable, especially for this generation, but nonetheless, it's the lowest level. The highest level of fear of Hashem is fear of Hashem like a good relationship. Meaning, if a husband and a wife have a healthy relationship, then the husband and the wife are not going to yell at each other and hate each other and do things like that. They're going to communicate. Now, the reason why, even if the wife makes the husband upset or vice versa, they're not going to act in a way where, for example, if let's say the, uh, the wife is not going to talk to the husband in a certain way or the husband is not going to talk to the wife in a certain way, not because they're scared that the other one's going to hit them. If you're scared the other one's going to hit them, then it's not a healthy relationship. We're talking about a healthy relationship. The reason why they're not going to insult the other person is because they're scared that this insult is going to lead to a disconnect. Where if I insult my wife, then she's not going to talk to me. And her not talking to me is unbearable to me. I can't deal with it. My whole day goes to nothing. So I can't do it, so then I'm not going to insult her. The husband is not going to insult the wife because of that. The wife is not going to insult the husband because of that. So that's not a fear of punishment per se that's physical, like the lowest level of serving Hashem, but rather a fear of a disconnect, of hurting the relationship. So that's the highest level of fear of Hashem as well, where Avram Avinu was willing to sacrifice his son Not because he was expecting some award from Hashem. Hey, listen, you're a tzaddik. You are Avram Avinu. Your you know, descendants are going to be like the stars of the heaven and the, uh, you know, uh, numerous like the sand and so on and so forth. No, you, know, you didn't expect any of that. He was willing to sacrifice his son because that was what Hashem requested or what he understood that Hashem requested. And he wanted to do everything he possibly can to be connected to Hashem. Didn't matter what it was. Didn't matter if there was a sacrifice. It didn't matter if it was hard. It didn't matter if it made sense. It didn't matter if it didn't make sense. Nothing mattered. He loved Hashem to such an extent that he wanted to make sure that he would do everything to not hurt that relationship, not hurt that connection. al But the point here is, is that he's telling you if you're serving Hashem, serve Him like Avraham Avinu. Where you're not just serving Him for an award of some kind. You're serving Him without any award. That's the highest level. Where even, like Job said, even if you were to kill you, you'd still do it. Why? Because that's the highest level. That's the ideal level. What is this like? If a father has two sons, again, and one of them really, really loves the father, and every time the father even hints that he wants something, the kid immediately goes and gets it. The father wants a coffee, he runs and he gets him a coffee. The father wants somebody to go get milk, he runs and he gets milk. The father wants a book or paper or this or that, he runs and he does everything right away. The other son doesn't really like his father that much. So he doesn't run anywhere. So the father says, listen, it's upsetting that I don't see him. I ask him for coffee, he doesn't do it. He says, okay, you know what? Okay, takes out his wallet, he goes, okay, if you go get me coffee, I'll pay you five bucks. Oh, for five bucks? Sure. He runs to the place, gets him coffee. 
Thank you, I love you, Abba. He doesn't really love Abba. He loves the five dollars. Abba wants paper. Abba wants this. Abba wants that. Every time it's for a payment. So now when the father is going to do his review one day, he's going to think about, you know, who do I really want to give my inheritance to? The one that milked me for money every single time I asked him for something. Every coffee cost me five bucks. Every ride cost me 20. Every, everything had a payment. Or the one that did it just because I asked him to. Just because he loved me. Who am I going to give my inheritance to? Well, the one I paid him all this reward. Okay, I love him. He's great. He's fine. He's my son. At least he did it. He's not a terrible son where he didn't do it even after I paid him. But the one that did it just because? Obviously, I want to give him more. So, Antigonos is telling you, if you're already going to do it, do it at the highest possible level. Shoot to be like Avraham Avinu. Shoot to be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Shoot to be like Noach. Noach ish tzaddik v'tamim. Complete with Hashem. The greatest of his generation. Go for the best. Just like you want, you go to work. You don't go to work because, oh, I want to make a basic living and be half homeless my whole life. No. You go to work to be a multimillionaire. You want to, the next idea is going to be Microsoft. The next idea is going to be Google. That's what you think. Everybody thinks that. Everybody thinks their next idea is the greatest thing since life's bread. That's why they go to work. Napoleon used to say, I want all my soldiers to want to be commanders. Any soldier who doesn't want to be a commander, I don't want him to be my soldier. Because if he doesn't want to be a commander, then he's definitely not going to be a good soldier either. You have an opportunity to be the greatest of great. So Antigonos is telling you, I learned from my Rav, Shimon HaTzadik, the greatest of his generation. The one that was around prophets at all times. The one that made uh, Alexander the Great bow to him. Alexander the Great, the guy that run, conquered the whole world, bowed to him on all four. I learned from him something amazing. He's telling you, if you're going to serve Hashem, go for the whole pie. And serve Him out of complete love. Not just because you're going to get an award. Do it just because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do to work on your midot. It's the right thing to do to not be angry. And work on yourself to realize that there's really never a reason to be angry. Ever. The only reason you're angry is because you have gava, you have pride. You think that the world needs to run according to your tune. And if it doesn't run according to your tune, you're angry. That's why the Gemara calls that idol worship. You've made yourself avodazara. You think that the world should run according to your tune. And if you think that the world needs to run according to your tune, you're a mini-god. You have a problem. There's no share of the world to come to somebody as a mini-god. So, someone that knows this says, okay, it's dangerous to have anger. I have to work on myself. I have to work on not being angry. Why am I angry? Why do I get upset every time the baby cries? Why do I get upset every time my wife wakes me up in the middle of the night with a question? Why do I get upset? Because this and this happened. All these different things that happen to your life, everybody has their, you know, little things, pet peeves that annoy them. Why does it annoy you? Why does it make you so angry? I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling sometimes how big things don't matter, but small things make you want to destroy the world like Hashem did with the time of Noah. I tell you personally, before Torah, if I was God, I would destroy the world every day. Every day I had like, I would get upset at these small things and I would literally want to just destroy the world. Like, oh, this guy came late. Sir, you just made a million dollars today. I don't care, but one of my employees came in six minutes late. What do you care that he came in six minutes late? My whole world changed because the guy came in six minutes late. You made money, you did this. 
doesn't make a difference. But that's the thing. When you have no real purpose in life, you make small, stupid things your purpose. So someone that wants to serve Hashem and get to the highest level has to know there's obviously a track of how to get there. You have to work on these midot. You have to work on your character traits, which is the reason why we're doing this whole series to begin with. But he's already telling you from the beginning, listen, the Torah is not of the mindset that you're not able to do something. The Torah will never tell you that you cannot be the most righteous person of your generation. The Torah will never tell you that you're not able to be a Talmud Chacham. The Torah will never tell you that you cannot do anything that will get you the greatest Olam Abba ever. Torah is the opposite. He's starting the Mishnah, the first three Mishnayot. It's not like somewhere in the middle, maybe it's less important. Chas v'shalom, but the point, you get my point here. The opening the Mishnah with this lesson that telling you, listen, if you're going to already service God, be like Avraham Avinu already. Be like Noah. Be like Moshe. Go for everything. Why are you settling? For just one little diamond. Okay, so you do tefillin really good. Chazaku Baruch. Do the prayer too, not just the tefillin. Why just the prayer? Act accordingly. Be a walking Sefer Torah. Learn some Torah also. Why just learn Torah? Fulfill it too. Do what it says in the Torah. Why just fulfill the Torah when you're in private? Do it in public. Show people why. It's a great thing to be a Jew. Why you're proud to be a Jew. Why you want to die to be a Jew. Go for the whole thing. Don't settle for half of modesty. Like sometimes I have women that ask, oh, is this modest? Like, you know, they send you a picture of some clothes or, or, or they give you, an, you know, a uh, question. Is this shirt modest? Is this thing modest? If you're asking if it's modest, obviously you realize there's some problem there. <laughs> if you're asking, obviously it's not clearly modest. Right or no? Yeah, I wants to do it. But you want someone to sign off that it's okay. You want me to sign off so I can go to Gainom instead. I don't want to go to Gainom for you. You're not going to go to Gainom for me. No one wants to go to Gainom for anybody else. So why do you want me to sign for it? You know it's modest or not. Same thing with people. Listen, is this a kosher deal? They sign a deal with somebody. It's clearly not kosher, not legally and not ethically. Is this kosher? You're asking me because you know it's not. Not that I'm telling people don't ask me questions. Ask me as many questions as you want. That's how you learn. But most of the time you know the answer. Your conscience knows the answer. Why? Because your neshama study the same Torah that I studied. Inside your mother's womb, it also studied the Torah. We know the same Torah. You know what's right and wrong. Everyone knows what's right and wrong. So the first thing you gotta ask yourself, am I really, am I being, am I full of it? If you're already gonna do it, do it 100%. And I give you a, something that you could implement in business also. La'avdil, obviously from Hashem, this is material of this world versus eternity. But to give you an understanding of, like, a lot of people ask me for like business ideas of what made us successful in the past. And um, I can tell you, this Mishnah, not that I knew this Mishnah all these years ago, but this Mishnah was one of the secrets to the success we had. This Mishnah. How? He's saying here, if you serve Hashem, not for the sake of reward, but rather serve Hashem just for the sake of serving Hashem, ultimately what's going to happen? You're going to get rewarded even more. The fact that you're serving Him, not for the reward, is going to get you the bigger reward. Avraham Avinu obviously has a higher reward than any of us, or anybody else, pretty much. Why? He didn't serve Hashem for the reward. He didn't go put his son on a slaughterhouse 
for some big uh, mansion. Yitzchak was not telling Abba, Abba, tight it a little tighter because Yitzchak said, oh yeah, I can't wait for my Abba to kill me because I'm going to get a big uh, lotto ticket in Shemaim. He didn't say that. Doesn't say it. There's no verse that says that. There's no Midrash even that says that. Yaakov didn't serve Hashem, make sure all of his sons at Tzadikim, make sure that Am Yisrael came from him, wasn't named Israel because he was waiting for Olam Abba. Oh, how great my reward is going to be in this Olam Abba. Moshe, same thing. Moshe didn't even want the job. He didn't even want the job, Bichlar. He says, I'm not good enough to have this great job that you want me to have. Who am I, Bichlar? I'm nothing. I'm less than nothing. David Amelech didn't want to be king, didn't want to be nothing. He said, I'm a worm and not ish. I'm a worm and not a man. Worm. So these extraordinary people teaching us something very, very important about business, actually. It says, because they serve the Shem, not for the reward, but just for the sake of it, they ended up getting a much greater reward, right? In the business world, one of the things that we used to do, which a lot of very successful companies do in one form or another, is offer a lot of stuff for free. A lot of stuff for free. So for example, if you notice anybody that has a smartphone, so you won't know this, you won't understand this part because you don't like smartphones. But you see that there's something called applications. There's something called applications. I gotta bust the chops a little bit about the smartphone thing. One day you have to get the smartphone. I have a tablet. <laughs> oh, a tablet? Okay, so you already told me chacham. It's fine. So you have, a you have the apps, right? But 99% of the apps, you can get them for free. Right, you get the app for free. But then after you use it for like two, three weeks, they ask you, do you wanna buy the full app? Because there's certain features that are missing. So why do they give it to you for free? They want you to, to get a taste out of it. And then it's easy to convince you to buy it. You even want to buy them. Sometimes it's free for so long that you want to pay for it just to make sure. This happened to me with one app. It was so good that even though it didn't cost money, I was looking for the premium version. Maybe it has something better. Once in a while it happens. I'm one of those guys that actually, if it's, it's something good, <laughs> I'll try to show some appreciation. So, but this is what we did on Wall Street. So I would offer clients different things for free, like an analysis of their other accounts elsewhere, a uh, second opinion on their business, and a bunch of different services for free that other people would charge an extraordinary amount of money for. Sometimes it worked out really, really well. Sometimes it wasn't. Some people that I did it for were unappreciative and actually really uh, made me second guess myself. But for the most part, uh, a lot of the success we had was because people saw that we cared. They saw that I care about what's going on in their life, what's going on in their business. What's go I would have conversations with them sometimes for an hour and a half about something that has nothing to do with business. They'd ask me for life advice. They'd ask me for advice with their kids. They'd ask me for advice with their business. They'd ask me with advice with uh, different employees they have. Different things that had nothing to do with the stock market, which is pretty much what I did for a living. My job was to invest their money. But we would have hour-long conversations about something completely irrelevant. But that's what made the deal. That conversation, that show of care, that's not for a reward of some kind. If I talk to the guy for two hours about giving him an analysis on his business, I'm not getting paid for the business. If he sells the company or doesn't sell the company, it doesn't make a difference in my life. If I give him a valuation of his company, which sometimes will take a lot of work, I would give him an evaluation which other companies can charge tens of thousands of dollars. Like if somebody wanted me to do that today, I would charge him you know, a couple thousand dollars an hour just to analyze their business, but I'll give him a real value. In the past, I would do it for free. Why did I do it for free? What was I, hate money or something? No, I liked money very much at the time. Why did I do it for free? I would give him a service that's, let's say, worth $10,000 for free, like analyze his business, or analyze his portfolio, or analyze something else. It's worth a lot of money, worth ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for free, without any expectation whatsoever. 
but end up inheriting different business where he would say, listen, this guy's such a nice guy. He analyzed my business. He did something that other people would charge me 10, 15 grand for. So you know what? Let me give him a little bit more work. So he would send me more money. And the transaction that I would do would be fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. So I would do a service for ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for free. And then he ended up sending me a few million dollars. So I would invest the money. I'd make 50, 100 grand. And this is how people, I got to a point where each month people would send me anywhere between two to $10 million every single month of new money to invest in the business, which is a considerable amount of money in that business. This is, as I always say, anything that's any good must have a source in the Torah. So this little bright idea that I thought I had, you see it's in the Torah. Serve Hashem, not because of the award. Because that's how you're really going to get the real award. If you're already going to get to that point, already do it. Now, the question is, why does Parashat Bechukotai in Kitavo, which is Leviticus chapter 26, verse 4, and Deuteronomy 11, verse 13. And each one has 10 verses and 13 verses, respectively, of blessings, material blessings. Why does Hashem mention all of these blessings that we're going to get? We're going to get money, we're going to get kids, we're going to beat our enemies. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Why is he mentioning all of these blessings? If in reality, we're learning here from one of the greatest sages that ever lived, that ideally, you should serve Hashem, not for the award. Why mention it then? No, Fidel, what do you think? Why mention in the Torah that you're going to get all this reward if ideally you really shouldn't be looking for it? Um, I don't know. I didn't know either before I learned this. <laughs> I always give you kafsul. I think you know more than me. So, right, okay. no, 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 no. so the Rambam, Rambam, in Ilchot Shuva. 9-1. He says something, Mamash breakthrough. In so many words, he's saying this. All of the awards of this world, the material, the money, the building, the wife, the kids, all of that stuff, that's not your real award for the mitzvot. Instead, they are an assurance from God that all the physical conditions necessary for man to perform the commandments will be provided to him so that he will be able to serve God even more and be worthy of greater reward in the world to come. Meaning, you do a mitzvah, you give masel, you give 10%. And you don't give it to Hanukkah parties, you give it to Zikwe Rabim, to Kiru, you do it for Tamidim Chachamim to learn Torah, you do something effective. And Hashem says, I'll make you rich. That's what he says. Maser v'titashel. Now he's not making you rich as an award for your maser. No, the award for the maser is a malam abad. What's going to the outcome of your maser is what you're going to get the award for. Why is he making you rich then? He's making you rich, according to the Rambam, according to our Torah, in order to allow you to make even more mitzvot. Because you made one mitzvah. 
I'm so happy with you, I'm going to give you another opportunity to make another mitzvah. As it says, mitzvah gorerets mitzvah. Each mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. So Hashem says, oh, you did one mitzvah? Oh, so you like my mitzvah. So let me give you another opportunity to do another mitzvah. So you give tzedakah, so I'm going to give you more money to give more tzedakah. You give more tzedakah, I'm going to give you more money to give more tzedakah. You got married? Oh, you made a mitzvah of, of getting married? I'm going to give you kids, so you have more mitzvot. You had one kid and the kid goes to yeshiva? Oh, I'm going to give you more kids. More kids are going to go to yeshiva. You have a legitimate operation in your business? Let me publicize it, make you successful, so you could not only give staka, but you could publicize how a Jew runs a business. So the material award that you get here is not the real award. It's nothing. It's Bob Kiss in comparison to the real award you're going to get in Olam Abba. But he's only giving it to you in this parashot. He says in the Torah, he's going to give you this material just to enable you to make more mitzvot. To give you an opportunity to make even more for the real world. This, if someone really thinks about it, is the ultimate definition of the graciousness of Hashem. If you think about it, Hashem owes us nothing. Nothing. We owe Him everything. Just like the Chafetz Chaim is here. I wrote all these books. I did all these days. But, but you did it. I didn't do anything. You allowed me to write it. You, allowed, you gave me the insight. To I did everything. But in reality, you did everything. Hashem owes us nothing. Everything that we have, it's purely us getting from Him. We give Him nothing. But he's telling us that the more you do of what I, you're commanded to do anyway, you're commanded to give tzedakah, you're commanded to lay feeling, you're commanded to be a servant of Hashem, you're commanded to keep Shabbat, you're commanded. It's not an option. You have to do it. The more you do it, the more I'm going to give you opportunities to do even more. The more you learn Torah, the more insights I'm going to give you of things you're going to find from the Torah that are going to make you even want to learn even more Torah. The more mitzvot you're going to make, the more opportunities I'm going to give you to make even more mitzvot. Which means, the more you do things that are going to get you an award that's eternal, the more I'm going to give you an opportunity to get even a bigger award. I don't want you to just be a millionaire in Shemaim. I want you to be a trillionaire. So if you're looking to be a millionaire, I want you to be more. So is that a reward? That's the ultimate reward. The ultimate. That's the real reward. All right. The reward is obviously what happens in Shemaim, but the actual award here is not the money he gives you, but the you ability to do something, do something with this something. money. Okay. The ability to do something with these mitzvot. That so they can be translated into... More health, more, right. more health, more positive attitude, exactly. more, more, more ways to, to... More ways to, to serve Hashem. To serve more, Hashem. more ways to be like Avraham Avinu. Right, right. Now Antigonos finishes this thing with something off. Where he says, okay, serve Hashem the ultimate way. Serve Him like Avraham Avinu. Don't serve him for some reward. Realize that he wants more for you than you even want for yourself. And nonetheless, fear, fear of heaven should be upon you. It doesn't really fit. It should be, if we understand the order of things, it should be, have fear of Hashem. That's the lowest level. And eventually get to being like Avraham Avinu, loving Hashem. But here he finishes it with it. Why? Because Antigonus is telling you this. If you're already going to serve Hashem, serve Him the best you possibly can. Look, go for the whole thing. But hey, if you don't make it, don't go crazy. Don't forget, you have to have Yirat Shemayim. At the least, have Yirat Shemayim. At the least, fear the Almighty. Maybe you're not going to be the next Avraham Avinu. Maybe you're not going to be Moshe Rabbeinu. Maybe you're not even going to be the local tzaddik. But don't turn into some kofel. Don't turn into some heretic and uh, you know, start uh, a, a new reform or conservative shul or something. 
or Christianity or Messianic uh, religion or something. Okay, you weren't Avraham Avinu. Fine. But listen, at the very least, you still have to have fear of the Almighty. You must have fear of the Almighty. Now, the Gemara says, and also Masechet Chagiga, Hashem was reviewing the nation. And he says, he didn't find a midah, a character trait, that Am Yisrael has better than poverty. Mara has amazing stories, but it's very scary. <laughs> so it says here in the Gemara, the best character trait that Am Yisrael has, according to Hashem when he did his review, is when they have poverty. And this is, uh, okay, so what's the Peshat here? What does is, what is the uh, Shages explain here? It says, what are we here for? Why did you come to... Did you ever ask yourself this? Robert Frank Kachlan just did a... We just did a video. Three-minute video. It's in Hebrew. We're going to get some type of subtitles to it. It's really a powerful video. It's only three minutes. But it's mamash powerful. It's very simple. It's a, it's, a, it's a video only of questions. No answers. It's only questions. What's the main question? Why did we come to the world? What's the purpose of life? Do you ever ask yourself this question? What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose? Why am I here? Why do I feel right when I eat a cow that was a living being? Well, I, I asked... Because I it asked, doesn't speak? I asked myself a question, but I don't know if... It's, it's kind of a different, but the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was the purpose of God to make the man. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, that's a question that I think it goes without what I said. I mean, did God has really in mind to make the man, knowing that all this sin will happen? Okay, Hashem, Hashem wanted to, is good and wanted to create good, so therefore he created man in order to give him good. So but, what about but the behavior? I mean, the, the, okay, but the, man has an opportunity to be righteous or wicked. Okay. If he's righteous, he gets rewarded for being righteous. If he's wicked, he gets punished for being wicked. But the point is that when man does not realize that in a clear way that he's only here because Hashem created him, then the question is, why is he here? So that's what the, is the point? That's, right, so right. if you don't have a God, okay, if you don't believe in God, then what's the point of your life? All right. Why are you here? So that's a Why did you come to the world? Why do you think that you have the right to kill an animal that's alive just like you and eat it? What makes you an authority over that animal? Why? Just because you have a weapon? What makes you have the right to kill a fish that's also life, a living being? There's many groups that are anti me, you know, they're all the, the vegetarian and vegan and, and so on, that they're anti uh, meat eating and so on, and even fish. And they say, what gives you the right to kill a cow? Who do you think you are? Are you going to kill a cow? Are you going to kill a sheep? Are you going to kill a lamb? Are you going to kill all these animals? What gives you the right to kill them? They're alive. They have families. They have kids. What gives you the right? What gives you the right to eat the tomato? Because according to science... The tomato is alive. Tomato is alive? That's why. That's why. That's the question I would ask the vegetarians. So right. Why so, do, why do you call it tomato? so tomato is alive. What gives you the right to eat a tomato? What gives you the right to eat a banana? What gives you the right to eat anything? It's all alive. Even plants that you don't eat have feelings. It was already tested in the 1950s. 
You already know since the 1950s, you connect a lie detector to a plant, it will actually move the, uh, the, the pin. It has feelings. If you think in your mind, I'm going to burn this plant, the pin goes all over the place. Showing signs of fear. Think, which means it can read your mind. So what gives you the right to chop down trees? What gives you the right? It's a big question. It is. Even more so, if you don't have a God, then what's the point of your life? Why are you so upset if somebody dies? If he had no purpose, if, if there was no purpose to his life, why are we so upset if he dies? Now you can't tell me that the purpose in life is to eat, because obviously it's not. You can't tell me that the purpose of life is to get married, because obviously it's not. Many people live life without getting married. So if it's a purpose, it must be universal. A species must have a universal purpose. It can't be that just one monkey has a purpose to climb trees and the rest of the monkeys have a purpose to just eat bananas, but not climb trees. That means that they're all right and he's wrong. It cannot be he has a different purpose. It has to be a universal purpose for a species and then independent goals or ambitions, if you will. If mankind has a purpose, it has to be a universal purpose and then independent ambitions. So if there is, as the atheists say, no God, then what is the purpose? Now if you say to get married, then obviously it's not because, that can't be because many people don't get married. If you say it's to have kids, the same answer is many people don't have kids. If you say it's to be successful, many people don't have success. As a matter of fact, as we said in, in, in previous lectures, if you make over $300,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of income earners in the entire universe of 7.6 billion people. $300,000 is not that much money. Yes, it's a lot of money, but it's not what we view as rich. We view as rich as like Donald Trump or something, or I don't know, or Hillary Clinton now, apparently. She's also very rich. Uh, that's what we view as rich, not $300,000. $300,000, a decent lawyer makes $300,000. But, at least in New, York, in New York they do, I don't know, in Florida maybe they make 10% uh, of that apparently, I don't know, some, sometimes more, sometimes less. But in New York everybody charges $1,000 an hour. So point being here is that if it's money, it obviously can't be money. It can't be food, it can't be money, it can't be your, it can't be something that ends. It can't be all just to build your company, what if the company goes out of business, then that means that there was no purpose. And not all of mankind is not part of your company. So a person must ask themselves, what is the purpose then? If it's to be nice, be a good person, like some people like to say, especially the young generation, is to be good and do good. Define good. Who defines good? Good to you may be bad to me. You view good as killing Jews. I view good as you not killing Jews. We have a problem. Your good is going to destroy my good or my good is going to destroy your good. Which means it cannot be our purpose because we must have a universal purpose. Our purpose must be the same. Can't be opposites. Half the world can say yes and the other one say no and we have, we're, say, we're the same species. Well, good is relative. Good, so that's the thing. So good, human level. humans, humans, humans that define good. It's it's a, they are defining it based on their own agenda. Okay. So that means that good cannot be defined by mankind. Good can only be defined by the manufacturer, oh. by the one that actually created them, by the one that actually defined what good is. Okay. So Hashem knows exactly what the purpose of the world is. For the good or for he the tells you what the good is and he tells the you what the bad is. And it's good for, for, for both. Exactly. Good. Exactly. So that's so that's so the thing. Kosher. 
Eat kosher, kosher is, is good, good universally good. The bar is good. Exactly, exactly. So now, if someone if someone is saying to do good, that's the purpose of life, then obviously you can't get to that point because your definition of good is not valid. Uh, so which gets us to a point where if unless you believe in an ultimate creator, you cannot get to a point of the purpose of life, answering the simple but important question of what's the purpose of life. And if there is no purpose, then why do we cry when someone dies? His time is over. He's going to turn into a plant, according to atheists. So what's the problem? Why are you crying? Why are you so upset? He had no purpose anyway. He was like the button that's on the bottom of shirts that you buy that, you know, that's never going to be used. What was it? I mean, he didn't bring anything to the world. Why are you so upset if he had no purpose? Which is the reason why everyone that's in hospice, about to die, they usually become very religious because they realize that they're, they were full of it. And what they claimed was the purpose of life, whether it was their company or their children or their marriage or their success or their fame or their show or all of these material things in reality are worthless because they can't take any of that to where they're going next. And they realize that the only one that could actually know the purpose is the one that created them and they knew what it was all along. They just decided not to listen. They decided to follow their desires and not listen to the source, which creates a very, very serious problem because if someone is alive in this world without knowing what their purpose is, they're in great danger of wasting their life and only realizing that they've wasted it once they've already arrived at hospice, once it's already too late. So we, we, we have uh, desires or needs? It's two different things. Two different things. Needs is I need to eat or else I'm going to die. I need to breathe or else I'm going to die. I need to, uh, you know, do all types of things for basic level survival. Desires is I want. I want a really nice car. I want a big house. I want a lot of money. I want this. I want that. People want all types of things. So the reality is, is that your wants are not needs. Right. The problem in today's generation, and in many generations before us, but specifically with us, is that we're constantly confused between the wants and needs. You see a little kid crying when he's in a supermarket, Ima, buy me the candy, I need it, I need it. No, no, you don't need it, you want it. You don't need the candy, you want the candy. Mm -hmm. You don't want the iPhone, you don't need the uh, uh, iPhone, you want the iPhone. So that's the that's the uh, yeah good. You don't you know. So so that so it's controlling it's controlling ourselves to a point where we realize that there is obviously a threshold, a threshold of where we have to distinguish between the two. Now in the Gemara where it says that Hashem did not find a midah, a character trait. It's better than poverty in Am Yisrael. What does Chazal say? Hashem wants us to be like one of the righteous people that we have the potential to be like. But He also knows that we have these desires. We have this Yetzirah, which we learned in Parashat Noach. Hashem, Hashem created us with a Yetzirah. We have these evil inclination that steers us in a direction opposite of what Hashem wants us to go in. Opposite of our purpose to life. So he says, listen, if I give you more money, 
then you can fulfill more of these desires. And if you fulfill more of these desires, you're going to want even more. And you're going to, with each time you fulfill one of these desires, you're more likely to get further away from me. The more money you have, the more problems you can get yourself into. The more problems you can get yourself into, the easier it is to forget about Hashem. So Hashem says, because I want you to be close to me, the best thing you can do is be poor. <clears throat> now this doesn't necessarily mean poor to the point where we can't eat, but poor to the point where we're just basic level surviving. And this is the reason why if you look at, for example, some of the major tzaddikim of this generation and past generation, whether it's Rav Steyman, of Kanievsky, all of these major tzaddikim in the world, if you go and see their houses, they literally look like a box of, you know, some old box from 300 years ago. It's unbelievable that they live in these conditions. To them, there's, no, there's nothing wrong in their eyes. But to the rest of the world that goes and sees it, it's unbelievable they live in this, these conditions, especially when you know that millions and millions of dollars cross their hands on a regular basis. Any one of these rabbis can ask anybody for $10 million, they'll get it tomorrow. No questions asked. Money goes through their hands on a regular basis to fund these yeshivas, to find these kolels, to fund all of these major organizations they have. They don't even touch. But they don't touch the money, they don't care for the money. All they need is for, just for their basic needs to survive. They just want, they literally want to live off of just their needs. Why? Because all they want, they already have. What is it? It's called Torah. When you really have Smart. Torah, you no longer have a desire for anything else. And this is why the Gemara is telling us that if you really know the significance of how difficult it is to battle the Yetzirah of money, you'd never pray for money. If you know your Yetzirah for major financial success, you'd never pray for it. If you know the major Yetzirah for some of these desires that we have, you'd never want them. Why? Because you know that you could potentially get yourself into some serious trouble. Now, the um, Grey Rebbe, who took over the Keilah, for his father the Sfatimit after he took over this Keilah these Hasidim came to him and they said your father promised us that if we recite the verse in Halel in Halel did I bring a Sidur? you have a Sidur? So, your father promised us that... No, it's okay, it's okay. No big deal. Your father promised us, in Rosh Chodesh, we say Halel. The prayer of Halel. It's one of the seven rabbinical mitzvot. No, it's okay, it's okay. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, don't worry. So, one of the seven rabbinical mitzvot is to say the Halel. Don't worry, don't worry. Fine. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. much. It's just breaking off the thing. It's, don't worry about it. It's really not that important. Thank you. It has some Hebrew in it, don't? Yeah, it has Hebrew. Yeah, it's really not that important. It's just uh, it I usually bring my studio with me. Where did he go? He's looking for a Sidur right now? Yes. No, it doesn't make a difference. It's not that important. Eh, shouldn't have asked. Said though. I'm sorry for making you go all over the place. It's not necessary. It's completely not necessary. Okay, so let's, let just, it's, I'll give you the point. So, Kila comes to the Gera Rebbe and he says, 
says it. Thank you. And it says, for the Rav, your father promised us that if we say the in Halel, every time we pray Halel, if we say Anna Hashem, and with a lot of kavana, mm -hmm. meaning save us Hashem, please Hashem save us, then our ends, then our prayers will be answered. But it's not working. It's not working. We checked. We, we, we've been doing it. We've been doing it. We've been doing it. And it's not working. We're uh, praying to Hashem. It's not working. So the Rabbi says, Which Anna do you think he meant? And I said, What do you mean? I says, Anna Oshiana, no? Please, Hashem, help us. Save us now. He says, no. That's not the one that he meant. The one that he meant is, Anna Hashem, Ani Avdecha. Which is in Psalm 116. 16, which is also in Halel. It comes before the Anna Hashem Oshiana. Hashem save us. Before it says Hashem save us, before it says Anna Hashem Ani Avdecha. Help me, Hashem. I am your servant. Meaning that Hashem provides the saves the people that claim themselves as his true servants. So before you go and start asking for Hashem to save you, ask yourself first. Are you truly a servant? Are you really serving Hashem like you're supposed to? Or are you doing everything only for the award? And if you're doing everything for the award, it's not exactly your full potential. You understand? So this is some of the things that we have to understand from this Mishnah. To finalize all of this, I give you a, there's a very, very famous story from this Mishnah that happened that actually teaches us the importance of teaching, but not just teaching, teaching the right way. In the book of Divrei Natan, which gives a pirush, gives a commentary on Pirkei Avot. It says of the story, which is Antigonus, Isuko, Ayulosh Tetal Midim, had two students. He had two students, Antigonus. And these Two students, there's a uh, debate whether it's the two students themselves misunderstood or the two students became teachers, but their students misunderstood, according to the Rambam. But one of the students was called Tzadok, and the other one was uh, Boethus. And these two students, they heard this Mishnah from Antigonus. I said, wait a minute. What is it saying in this Mishnah? Don't serve Hashem like someone that's looking for a reward. Serve him like that's not looking for a reward. Like maybe these sages, maybe these rabbis are saying, don't serve Hashem like there's an award because they know that in reality, there really isn't an award. In reality, there isn't Olam Abba. So why would they say? What other reason would they say? Don't expect an award. Maybe they're saying there's no award. So these two, instead of going to the rabbi and getting to the bottom of it and asking questions, what do they do? 
they ended up becoming complete kofrim, complete heretics. And they started two movements, one called the Sadducees, named after Sadok, and one called the Boitusim, which is after Boitus, named after them, these two. Uh, and their major push is against the oral Torah, against the rabbis. Said, so listen, okay, the written Torah is fine, we agree with it. But the oral Torah, we don't believe in it. Because look what it says in the oral Torah. It says, don't worship Hashem, don't serve Hashem for an award. So if you're not going to serve Hashem for an award, that means it probably isn't an award. So the whole thing is fake. The whole thing is not good. They don't know what they're talking about. So this is very, very important to teach us. A very valuable lesson for anybody that's teaching, whether it's someone that's teaching themselves or someone that is teaching others is that the power of your word is much more significant than you can imagine. The power of your actions is much more significant than you could imagine. In Parashat Noach, we learned that Hashem gave Noach a sign. The sign was, I'm not going to destroy the world, and as a sign, I'm going to put this rainbow. Less than 350 years later, the Tower of Babel is built by a bunch of wicked people that are trying to build a building that is going to go fight God. And Hashem says, since they have unity, even though they're wicked, they're not hurting each other. The power of unity is that Hashem is not going to punish someone that's united. The reason why, for example, you see the uh, Arabs, according to numbers, they should rule the world, even though they already rule a big part of it through their terrorism, but nonetheless, they should actually literally rule the world. They have numbers, they have two billion people, and a lot of money, and so on. Why don't they rule the world? Because they don't have unity between them. If they had unity between them, Shem Elachem. It's mamash, mercy from Hashem that they don't have unity. Same thing with Am Yisrael, Avdil. If Am Yisrael had unity, the, the few million that we have in the world had actual unity, we'd also rule the world. The power of unity is extraordinary. So Hashem says, these people at the Tower of Babel had unity. That's why it didn't destroy them. So what? But in order for them, I couldn't let them continue sinning and going against me. So what did I do? I created 70 languages. Before that, there was only one language. It was just the Hebrew holy language. That's the, that was the universal language. That was the only language that was spoken in the world. But now at the Tower of Babel, which is at the end of Parashat Noach, we see that Hashem bilbel et haolam. That's why it's called Babel. Babel is bilbel, like to confuse the world. He confused them by having each one of them speak a different language. So when each one said something to the other, they didn't understand each other. So they could no longer deliver on their word. And it says in the uh, Gemara Bava Metziah, page 49, whoever paid the punishment to the generation of the flood and the generation of the Tower of Babel, he will pay the punishment to the one who doesn't stand by his own word. So here the Chazal tells us that the same one that punished the generation of Noah is the same one that punished the generation of the Tower of Babel. He also will punish the one who doesn't hold his word. Meaning, Hashem punished the generation of Noah but then made a promise not to destroy the world after it by creating a uh, rainbow. So even though he could have destroyed the world again at the Tower of Babel, he didn't destroy the world, he just destroyed that area over there. Destroyed the Tower of Babel and a lot of those people themselves, even some of them turn into monkeys and so on. Why didn't he destroy the world at the Tower of Babel? Aside from unity, because he made a word. He gave his word that I'm not going to destroy the world again. So the Mishnah here is telling us that the value of your word is extraordinary because Hashem is saying, I've been keeping my word for over 5,700 years. Every time you see a rainbow, technically Hashem wants to destroy the world. But I haven't destroyed the world because of the words, because of the promise I made to Noah. Less than 5,700 years, about 4,000 years ago. Promise I made to Noah, 
not to destroy the world, I'm still holding my word. So just like I held myself at the time of after Noah, at the Tower of Babel, at the time after Egypt, before Egypt, after Egypt, Bet HaMikdash, and so on and so forth, all these times, millions of times that I had an opportunity and a right to destroy the world, I didn't do it because I'm good for my word. I expect you to do the same. So when someone makes an agreement with somebody else and doesn't hold their word, here the Gemara is telling you that you are going against God here, not just against people, because you're doing something that's the opposite of God. Just like Hashem is always gracious, always giving, this is the reason someone that's stingy, someone that's cheap, gets punished. Why? Because it's literally the opposite of God. Hashem always gives and never receives. So someone that's cheap doesn't want to give. So it's the opposite of Hashem. Same thing with in regards to someone that doesn't hold their word. Someone that makes a promise and doesn't keep his promise. You make a promise, you're not going to hold your word. It's the opposite of what Hashem has been doing for all these years. So the, the value of your word is extraordinary. And this Mishnah Antigonos is teaching us how important it really is because on one end, if we take the teachings of Shimon HaTzadik, we see that Shimon HaTzadik is giving us the secret to ultimate success. He's saying, if you're already going to go for it, worship Hashem, be a servant of Hashem, be like Avraham Avinu, be like Yitzchak, be like Yaakov, be like Moshe, be like the Gdol Adol, be like somebody great. But at the very least, have some Yirat Shemayim. That's if you understand that Mishnah correctly. If you don't understand that Mishnah correctly, if the word that was taught to you was incorrect, if the teacher was too scared to tell you the truth, if you just want you to, to know some parts, not the other parts, then Chas Shalom, someone can turn out to be like the Sadducees and end up becoming a complete kofel. Say, no, the only reason you're said in this Mishnah don't uh, expect a, uh, don't work for Hashem, don't serve Hashem for a, uh, an award because there is no award. And if there's no award, then there's no point to do all of it. Which is what happened with the Christians that are pretty much saying that, listen, you serve Hashem without doing anything. Just believe in this guy and that's it. Every, he died for your sins, he died for them. You can just do whatever you want. You could be modest, you could be stingy, you could be a murderer. You can be whatever you want. As long as you believe in this guy, everything's fine. To put up, you're safe. If you believe in it, everything is fine. So it's complete nonsense. It's completely against the Torah. Now, people don't have the final as last point. I'll give you a story I just heard today. Um, people don't have an understanding, a full understanding of the magnitude of the sages that are mentioned in this Mishnah. As I mentioned in the beginning of the shiur, each one of these people was able to revive the dead. What people give this J.C. Penny guy credit for that he revived somebody from the dead, whether he did or he didn't, there's no proof of it. Even if he did, it's not a big deal. Because every single person mentioned in the Gemara did the same thing. And more. There's a uh, story in the Gemara that says a... Uh, Rabbi Yochanan, one of the uh, people, there was two kids that were his uh, nephews that would come to the yeshiva. Both of them were mute. Both of them mute. They weren't, they weren't able to. They were born without the ability to speak. So no one knew if they're smart, if they're not smart. Can't, they can't speak. They can't teach. They can't answer. They can't nothing. All he would see when he would teach them is just they're nodding. They're nodding. Nodding. So one day he had mercy on them. He prayed, and they both got healed. Both were able to start able to start speaking. Something they were born without the ability to speak. It's not like a, uh, you know, they cut their tongue. So they were never able to speak. All of a sudden, Rabbi Yochanan prays, and both of them are able to speak. And then they start teaching, and everyone finds out these two are geniuses. So all this time we didn't know what Torah they knew because they couldn't speak. But now we know, because now they can speak. But the point of the story of, of relevant to us is that we see that he was able to change, the you know, sages were able to change nature. Okay, PTS, it says in the book of Jeremiah, 
you'll be like my mouth. So each one of these sages, when they write something, it's much more than just some, uh, you know, some guy, some author wrote a book in a book or something like that. When there's an halacha that they have passed, it's the difference between life and death. And to give somebody an idea, I heard this story today. Today, Bo Hashem. You know, these near-death experiences where people die and come back to life are happening more and more often. Millions of people have died and come back to life. And every one of them is reporting a very similar story. They saw light. Some people see more. Some people see less. Some people talk to people there. Some people don't. But the point is that very similar stories across the board. And some people see things that are beyond the normal. Like, for example, Rabbi Alonanava that, you know, started getting Torah knowledge that you couldn't get unless you studied Torah for at least 25, 30 years. And even then, it's not necessarily guaranteed. So different things that people get from these near-death experiences. It's really amazing. And it says at the end of uh, time, there's going to be all types of strange things. This is not different than what we've learned from the books. But there was another woman that uh, just shared her near-death experience. She died and came back to life. And she was a religious woman. She's always been a religious woman. Um, and But she was making her own sins. She was saying Lashon Ara. She was a, uh, complaining about God because her life was very difficult. She says about herself that she, uh, even though she was religious as far as making the mitzvot, having emuna, not so much. The, the operating stuff, as far as the way the world looks at her, of course. Yeah, it looks, you're making the mitzvot, you pray, you look a certain part. The outside, the exterior looked perfect. But she says on herself, the interior was completely broken. And I was constantly complaining against Hashem. I was constantly thinking that, uh, you know, things are not right. I was constantly saying Lashon Ara about you know, certain types of people and ta da 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 And then she says when she had this near-death experience, whether it was a heart attack or something that just pretty much got her out of this world, she went up to the Bedin of Shemaim. And I'm not going to go through the whole story, but the point is that she went to the Bedin of Shemaim and she's the Dayan, the Bedin of Shemaim, so the Chazal say that the uh, the head of the Bedin is going to be the Gdola, the, the Gdola Do of that generation. There's going to be different. There's three Dayanim, and the uh, ones that are the head of them are the highest Neshamot of that generation, the Gdola Do. So she saw one Dayan over there, which she didn't mention his name. And then she saw Ravavadya. Ravavadya. Zachar Tzadik Livacha. And the other Dayan was saying, she was crying, you know, she saw her whole life. She was embarrassed. She went through this whole shame. She said it was like she wanted something worse than death for herself. For all this shame. And even though she was a religious woman. How dare I complain against Hashem? All these different things she says in the story. It's mamash. It's very. Uh, I wish it was in English so more people could see it. But anyway, she says in the story. After all the shame, I'm begging for help. I'm begging for them to bring me back to my body. And the Dayan says, "No, she will not return." Meaning, it's it. She's dead. And she's begging and begging him, no, please come back. I have kids. I have a husband. I promise to do tshuva. I promise to never complain against Hashem. I promise not to say Lashon Ara. I promise this. I promise that. No, not coming back. You're not going to come back. This is Dayan. This is not like a uh, police officer. This is Dayan in Shemaim. He says, no, you're not coming back. He says, no. And she's hysterical crying. But then she starts seeing the Neshamot. Of the people she helped them do tshuva. 
A few people she helped, a few women she helped them by teaching them how to do tarat mishpacha, how to, you know, to keep the nida. A few people she taught them how to keep Shabbat. She says, no, help me, help me. Tell them that I taught you Torah. Tell them that I taught you this. And then Rav Ovadia says to her, you're going to go. You're going to come back. <laughs> but the other day, Anne says, no. She's not going to come back. He's arguing with him. She's not going to come back. Rav Ovadia says she's going to come back. She's going to come back. She's not going to come back. And she says, I'm crying, hysterical. Please, Kvodarav, please, please, give me the chance. Give me the chance. Give me the chance. And the guy keeps saying, no, 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 no. And then she says, Rav Avadya slams on the table and says, she's, I rule, she comes back. And she woke up. Oh. What's my point? Sages that are mentioned in the Gemara, are people that are beyond our understanding. Matters of life and death, eternal good or eternal suffering were decided just by their words. So to say, ah, I don't agree with the Rambam. Ah, I don't think Rabbi Akiva was right. Ah, Rabbi Adesar ben Holkinos is a little more extreme. A little of this. Like, who are you, Bechlal, to even question these people, you little midget? Eternity is decided by their words, and you're saying you agree or don't agree. You even give an opinion, Bechlal? Your opinion is meaningless. You just discovered if there's a purpose to life. You're saying you're going to agree or disagree with Allah of people that decide life or death. In Shamaim, this is one of the most important and val in, in valuable lessons you can learn from Avot. Who are these Avot, Bichlal? Who are these and how can we eventually pray just to be their shoes that they threw out? Once we realize even a little bit of how great they were, then maybe we can start appreciating the Torah that you're try trying to teach us. But until we get to a point of realizing how great they were, we're never gonna appreciate their Torah. As long as someone thinks that their opinion, their little measly opinion, their little 2016 opinion, or 5777 year opinion, is valid in any way, shape, or form in comparison to the sages that spoke to God through Ruach HaKodesh, or prophecy, or face-to-face -face like Moshe Rabbeinu, there's nothing to talk about. I can't teach you Torah. You can't learn Torah. Can't do anything. You think your opinion counts? You think you're anything? You're in a different world. You're so far away from where reality is. We have to go send you to keep watching Rabbi Fahim Kachlan's three-minute video. Ask yourself, what's the purpose of life? What's the purpose of life? You're still in a, such a far stage. It's, this is too far for you already. You understand? So the point of all this is to make ourselves better human beings. Rule number one, start your day by saying thank you. Any questions? Amen. Oh. Oh. I have a question on the, on the, the parasha. Oh, good. Yeah, sure. The one yesterday, there, when you were explaining the, the, the why, um, I mean, about going, uh, being a, a show on Shabbat. Yes. I mean, to keep Shabbat, uh, why is not uh, not allowed? Not allowed. Uh, it's not allowed or not recommended. That was my my. Opinion. Not allowed. Not allowed because not allowed. They, they would create another. It's another religion. Can you explain yes. a little bit? Right. So, now, if you have you have six hundred thirteen mitzvot in Judaism from the Torah, seven seven laws from the rabbis, right? Mm -hmm. So six hundred twenty total laws. But each one of those laws breaks down into many other laws. There's halachot and so on. But the point is, is that Judaism is defined by those. This is how someone that wants to be Jewish has to comply with all of those laws that apply to him. If he's a Kohen, there's certain laws that apply to him. If he's not a Kohen, there's certain laws that don't apply to him. If, he's a, if, if it's a woman, there's certain laws that apply to her. If it's not a woman, if it's a man, then there's certain laws that uh, apply to him and so on. So 
everything that applies to that person, they must do if they want to be Jewish. Now, to say that you can just take one law and keep that without keeping the rest is in essence saying that the Torah is incomplete. It's imperfect. That you can just choose different parts of it and selectively choose whichever one you want, like custom made. Which in essence means that you are deciding what's good and what's bad and you're not listening to the source who decided what's good and what's bad. Hashem gave all of those laws. He didn't say, listen, you can keep some of them and you don't have to keep some of the other ones. Everything that apl applies to you, you have to keep. That's why every time he mentions to observe the mitzvot in the Torah, in the book of Exodus, in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Numbers, in the book of Deuteronomy, pretty much all of the books that talk about mitzvot, every single time he says, observe my commandments, every time he says, observe all my commandments. Oh, oh my he doesn't say, just observe some. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, ah, observe just Shabbat, Tarat, Mishpacha, and Tefillin, you're fine. Mm -hmm. You're good. It's on me. Don't worry. You're, it's too toughy. Don't worry about it. He doesn't say that. He says all or nothing, which means if you want to observe the commandments, you have to know that you have to observe all of them. Now, of course, to some people, obviously, it's very, very difficult to observe all the commandments, but that doesn't mean they don't have to. You're still obligated to do it. The fact that you're not doing it doesn't mean it's okay that you're not doing it. It just means that you're not doing it and you'll get punished for not doing it. Uh, if you're obligated to do it, you're not doing it, you'll get punished for it. So, it doesn't necessarily mean, so, just like I told my first uh, student in Florida, I told him, listen, first year we had, I wish I would have recorded it, first year we had, I told him, listen, I'm going to tell you the truth, and you do whatever you want. Meaning, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm not going to tell you what I think you, uh, you know, you're able to hear or not able to hear. I don't know what you're able to do or what you're not able to. I'm going to tell you what God said. And you do whatever you want. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to say you're good or you're bad or anything. I'm going to tell you what you have to do. And I told him. And I knew he doesn't keep Shabbat. So right off the first shot, I already told him, listen, you're not, you know, you're not allowed to drive on Shabbat and so on. And to him, it was a surprise. He's been driving to shul for 25 years. No one ever told him anything. And I told him, listen, you're never allowed to drive on Shabbat. If you want to drive, drive. It's your problem. But you're not allowed you, to. You are in the process of conversion. It doesn't matter. If you're in the early, early stages of conversion, then yes. I mean, you're still, still early. But if you're in the later stages of conversion, meaning you're planning on converting within a few months, then yeah, you have to start keeping no, Shabbat 99%. Everything. Everything except one small violation. Uh -huh. uh, the, the one last violation that you do, which is intentional, like turning on a light, not driving. A small violation that you do internally. Um, and uh, then, you know, usually like a month before you uh, convert, then you keep 100%, not 99%. But the point is, is that I told him, listen, I'm going to tell you what it is and do what you want. So if I know you drive on Shabbat, I'm telling you you're not allowed to. Continue driving, that's up to you. Either way, now you know the truth. Now you know the truth. So the same thing with anyone else that's out there, they have to understand. If they want to keep all of the laws in the Torah, they have to they convert to Judaism. They can't just pick and choose a mitzvah they want to listen to or not. Why? Whether it's Shabbat or it's anything else. Why? Because that would mean that you're creating your own religion. You're just taking a few mitzvot that are in the Torah and saying, okay, I like these, I don't like the rest. Right. You can't do that. That's not what God said. So that's what Rambam is saying. It's not that Hashem says that, hey, listen, uh, the goyim are uh, you know, bad people. No, there's plenty of goyim that are great people. Some of them are even prophets. Job was not a Jew, but he was a prophet. Mm -hmm. So it was some of the greatest people that ever lived were goyim. It's not a problem. <laughs> The point is that Hashem is telling us here is that, listen, you have an option. You're either going to be a Jew. Anyone can be a Jew. Practically and everyone in our generation could be a Jew. You want to be a Jew? You want to keep Shabbat? You want to keep kosher? You want to keep all these mitzvot? Chazak Baruch? Convert? No problem. You want to just keep Shabbat? Not allowed to. You're allowed to rest on Shabbat, even if you're not Jewish. You're allowed to not work on Shabbat, even if you're not Jewish. You're allowed to celebrate on Shabbat, even if you're not Jewish. You're allowed to have a nice meal on Shabbat, even if you're not Jewish. 
What you're not allowed to do as a non-Jew is you're not allowed to refrain from doing things specifically because it says it in the Torah. Meaning, it says in the Torah, do not light fire. So you're not allowed to not light fire because it says it in the Torah, because you're not allowed to do it. You're not allowed to refrain from the 39 restrictions that it says in the Torah that you're not allowed to do if you're not Jewish. Why? Because that would mean that you're keeping a law that's not for you. If you want to keep it, then keep everything. If you don't want to keep, if you want to keep everything, don't keep that either. You can celebrate on Shabbat. You can enjoy your Shabbat. There's no questions about it. You can make it a day of rest. You can celebrate and make it a great day. But you can't keep Shabbat. Unfortunately, what happens, this actually brings me to another point. There are some of the, uh, this generation, I heard it at least from um, two places, two, two people uh, that um, are telling people that non-Jews are allowed to keep Shabbat. Noahides are allowed to keep Shabbat. And they're calling it Geret Tzedek. They're calling it all different types of names. And in essence, they're, yeah, they're, 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 calling it, they're calling it all types of things. And they're confusing the public. And this actually goes back to our teaching of this parasha. Is that if we truly understood, truly understood and respected who these sages are, we'd never dare say something that they didn't say. We'd never dare. We'd never dare. If, the, if, it, if it doesn't say in the Mishnah, if it doesn't say in the Shulchan Aruch, if it doesn't say in the Gemara, if it doesn't say literally somewhere in the Torah by one of these great minds that a certain Allah is that a Jew, that a non-Jew is allowed to keep Shabbat, who are you to say otherwise? So that's also a level of arrogance that some people have where it's not intentional. Like they're trying to do chesed. They're trying to do kindness for people. But in reality, they're not doing a kindness because they, they want to, people to um, not feel like they're left out. But if they really wanted them to feel not left out, just tell them just convert to Judaism. If you want to keep Shabbat, convert to Judaism. Right. What's the, what's the yeah, problem? What's the, that's what I, that's you know, so, so that's the thing. So listen, as far as, as far as keeping Shabbat in regards to enjoying the dinners, the lunches, the prayers... The uh, family, you can do that anyway. Right. You don't have to be Jewish to do that. You can do that every day if you want. Right. But as far as refraining from the 39 restrictions, that is specifically it's, for, Jews. for Jews. So if you want to be Jewish, be Jewish. Right. You know, so, so that's the thing. I know for some people, I have one student, an amazing, amazing human being. She is mamash, like a uh, special soul. If she could convert, she'd convert today. Not tomorrow, today already. In the middle of the shul, she'd convert. And she knows probably more than most people, most rabbis even. She knows a lot of Torah. And she wants to convert. Um, but her husband is not ready yet. He's concerned. He believes in the Torah, Baruch Hashem. And, but he's concerned that he's not going to be able to fulfill the entire Torah. He's not going to be able to fulfill all the mitzvot because he doesn't know enough which is an incorrect feeling. Why? Because you're not rewarded in Judaism for fulfilling the entire Torah. You're not rewarded in Judaism for learning the entire Torah. You're not rewarded in Judaism for knowing the entire Torah. What are you rewarded for? You're rewarded for trying. And this is actually going to be one of the Mishnayot in Pirkei Avot. It's in Pirkei Avot. We're going to learn it. The key is to try your best. The key is to do everything you can to be modest. Do everything you can to be righteous. Do everything you can to have kavanah in your prayer. Do everything you, you can to learn as much as you can. Okay, I know it's 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm really tired. Let me push an extra 5 minutes. 5 minutes I have. Maybe I don't have another hour to study. Maybe I don't have that much power and that much strength to study for another hour. But 5 minutes I have. And you study the next 5 minutes. That extra 5 minutes, according to the Gemara, could be more valuable than a year worth of Torah. So, you get rewarded for that five minutes. That's, the, that's what Hashem is looking for. He's looking for Mesirut Nefesh. He's looking for self-sacrifice. He's not looking for you to be an Alakha computer. He's not looking for you to be a, uh, you know, just a, uh, a robot. He's looking for you to try your best. 
Try your best. Im it paves the way for the rest. Hashem elachem lachem v'atem techalishun. In Exodus 14, 14, Moses tells Am Yisrael, God will fight your wars and you shall remain silent. Meaning that once you've already exerted all of your own effort, you've tried your best. I tried my best to make Panasa. I tried my best to find a zivug. I've tried my best to, you know, work on my tefillah. I tried my best to understand this Gemara. I tried my best in whatever it is that you're doing to serve Hashem. I tried my best, Hashem. Now it's your turn. That's the bottom. That's, that's Judaism. That's connection to Hashem. So if he's watching this lecture right now, the best thing I can tell him is the best thing I've always, I've told him before, I believe, is that you don't have to worry about fulfilling the entire Torah. The only thing you have to worry about is fulfilling your job, meaning doing your best, which you're obligated to do anyway. Right. Even if you're not Jewish, you're obligated to do your best. As a non-Jew, you you're obligated to try your best to be a righteous Noahide, which means that if you're already exerting your best, this Mishnah says, go for the best. Go for Abraham Avinu. It says in this Mishnah. Yep. That's the beauty of it. So you see that all of this insight that we've learned for the last couple of hours, this is one from two verses in the Torah. Yeah. Two verses. One little ma'amar from one of them. Tigo knows that's all of it. We could talk about it for another week. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine this whole book is full of it. And this is one of thousands and thousands of books that we have in the Torah, tens of thousands of books. So when somebody in this generation, this lowly generation, says, no, no, I don't think that the Rambam is right. Oh, I don't think that Antigonos is right. I don't think that Rabbi Akiva is right. So who are you? You're not even an ant next to these people. An ant is actually closer to them than you are because an ant at least knows she's not like them. You understand? So that's the thing. The most important part that someone needs to truly understand when they're learning Torah Know your place. Know where you are. Know where you stand. These are extraordinary people. And as we learned from the story today, apparently they're, uh, they're not finished with their job in this world. They're deciding who lives and dies sometimes still. Anything else? Baruch Hashem. We had another great shiur. Bezat Hashem. Next week, uh, we have a shiur at the uh, usual shiur Tuesday night at my house. And then Wednesday, we have a shiur at the, uh, the Lighthouse Project in uh, Aventura. Oh, okay. So we're back to doing that every two weeks. Uh, Bezat Hashem, we're going to do a shiur there every other week okay. uh, at the Lighthouse Project. So I think it's not far from me. It's like 20 minutes from here or something from like that. From here, 20 minutes yeah. with no traffic. Three hours with traffic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Bezat Hashem, we're going to do a shiur over there. Most likely, I believe we're going to continue the series over there as well. And now as you say that, I remember... We're just going to continue the series in every lecture because there's just so much in each Mishnah that it's a, uh, it's a, it's a lecture of its own. Now you say that, I re I'm now talking about the word you say that the sages have mm -hmm. made, you know. I remember uh, uh, a story, it was a personal story about... It's a, we're going downtown to the parking lot there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was with a friend of mine, he has his kippah and everything, he went back. But the time he wanted to pay there, he, he forgot that, I mean, we forgot the wallets in, the, mm -hmm. in, in my car. Oh, do you no, it's fine, it's fine. No, it's fine, it's fine. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. No, no, I'm looking if the ah. thing is still on. Where is the battery? So, anyway, so when we got the, 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 the guard in there, I said, look, I, I don't see it. The guy said, get in there, don't worry about it. Give me the ticket. Mm -hmm. When we went there, the car went, went out and everything, they said, let's buy by the car, pass by the car, go and pay. So we went there, and he was there. And then the guy wasn't there. And then he told them, look, the other person that was here, uh, we, we didn't pay, so we have the money. He said, do you know something? That was exactly the same thing he told me. Hmm. He said, I gotta go. But it's something that's pretty sure is going to happen here. It's a guy that's going to come and pay you. He said, you, they have a word. He is probably going to come here and pay you. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a, it's a, so, 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 so it's, a, it's, it's a word. When you, have, when, you, when you are educated to have your word, I said, 
For me, it was a lesson because I didn't have my keeper on. Mm -hmm. I said, my goodness, he said, he says, but why he didn't win it? Because he, he saw so, he saw you keeper. Mm. So he said, he's Jew. He's gonna come and pay. <laughs> Don't accept his payment. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, when when someone is a as a uh, is a Jew, it's the world will hold you to a higher standard. Whether you like it or not, the world will hold you to a higher standard. And it's a uh, there's one chidush that I gave I don't know, maybe like a year and a half ago that uh, is definitely worth saying again because it gives people an understanding of what's expected from them. Just like in the uh, story of, we just mentioned of the Gera Rebbe that told him, listen, you know, you're uh, asking for Hashem for, to save you, Anna Hashem Oshiana, but right before it says, Anna Hashem Oshiana, it says, Anna Hashem Ani Avdecha, Anna Hashem, uh, you know, I am your servant, so first he says, try your best, be his true servant, then I'll help you. So people have a confusion about which one comes first, which one doesn't, so Chazal, the sages, on Sheik Neset Agdola, this very same sages that put this book together, the very same sages that gave us our entire Torah, they also put together our prayer, different parts of our prayer. And one part of the prayer is the um, Korbanot, Korbanot, which is the part that uh, we talk about different korbanot and how we uh, you know the uh, Hashem has an incense offering that we're decreed to do and it says you know there's different parts to the incense offering and it has to be done in a precise way and it gives you exactly which incense offering there is and we say this a couple of times a day we say it twice in Shachrit and once in uh, Mincha the Sephardics I think uh, Ashkenazi say it less times, but nonetheless, it said. Everyone knows what Koba note is. It's in the Sidu. And most people don't understand really when they read it. A lot of people know it by heart. And they read this Koba note, they read this incense offering, and it says that the smell of the uh, incense offering is pleasing to Hashem, which is what it says in the Torah. They're not really understanding the purpose behind it. So I had a chidush some time ago, Baruch Hashem. In this very same prayer, it says that two of the sages, Rabbi Natan and Rabbi Yehuda, mm -hmm. both say the same thing, that if one of the incense offerings is incorrect, one of them is incorrect, chayav mita, death penalty. Death penalty. Meaning if instead of 50 grams, you put 40 grams, or 60 grams, or you just didn't put it at all. Death penalty. I told the first, I read this, and everybody reads this every day. No one ever asked themselves, what do you mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit extreme? Okay, I understand, listen, coming into the Kodesh Kodeshim drunk, I understand, okay, Chayamita, that I understand. Okay, you show up to Hashem, drunk, you deserve death. Just for even thinking about it, you deserve death. Violating Shabbat, okay, we already see, it's Lofchad. Violated Shabbat, first violator of Shabbat, Chayav Mita, I understand. Somebody murders, it says, Ten Commandments, one of the commandments, do murder, Chayav Mita, I understand. But messing up on an incense offering, I get a death penalty? Come on, no Hashem. Why so uptight? What's going on here? So the beauty of it, when you understand what's going on here, takes this mitzvah, to, takes this prayer to a different level, number one. And number two, also shows you your responsibility as a Jew. So first we need to understand, what is this incense offering? What did it actually do physically in the world? What did it do? So Chazal teach us that when they would make this incense offering, it would create a pillar of smoke. Create a pillar of smoke, like you see a... Uh, you know, a, uh, a pillar or a building. A pillar. Okay, straight up. And this pillar would reach all the way to the sky. And even if there was strong wind, it wouldn't move. So now what happened? What's the effect 
of this pillar of smoke. And you have three people that see this pillar of smoke. We were in the desert for 40 years. We we're in a bit of Mikdash for a total of 900 years, the first one, the second one. You have three different types of people see this pillar of smoke. There's someone from the local camp that's a Jew. There's someone that left the camp that's a Jew. And there's a Goy. The Jew that's in the camp, that's in the Bet HaMikdash, sees this pillar, he's having day-to-day -day problems. He's having emunah problems. Parnassah didn't come in on time. He's having some difficulties with his wife. He's confused of what the purpose of life is for. He's not really sure what's going on. He sees the pillar, he says, ah, it reminds him. They're talking to God now. When the pillar is going, they're, they're talking to Hashem. Okay, Hashem, I understand. I have a munah now, because I see Hashem. I see, I see, it's, I see the, the work of Hashem. There's this miracle of a pillar being, in a, you know, not moving it despite wind, despite rain, despite everything. It's a, a miracle. I see it. It helped my emunah. So I helped that guy. The second guy that's a Jew that's outside of the camp, he got into an argument with his keila. Machloket. Should we pray Ashkenazi style? Should we pray Sephardic style? Should we pray Yemenite style? Should we use this chazan, that chazan? He says, you know what? I'm leaving everything. I don't like it. He left. But you know, when you go away, every once in a while, you turn around. Like, you turn around. You see how far you are from where you came from. Because you want to, you know, checking out things. So when he turns around after he's like in the mountains already, what does he see? He also sees the pillar. He's like, ah, it reminds him. He's like, ah, listen. Judaism is not based on the Jews. Judaism is based on your relationship with Hashem Barach. So it doesn't matter if I'm a Jew inside uh, the Bet HaMikdash with tens of millions of Jews or I'm on an island by myself, I still have to be Jewish because the connection to Hashem is what's important. From the pillar. Helps him, says, okay, so let me come back. Forget about this machloket, who cares? He comes back. What'd you do now? You did kiruv. You brought him back. First guy, you helped him with emunah. Second guy, you helped him, you did kiruv. You brought him back, do tshuva. The third guy, who is it's the goy. He's from a different nation. And what is he saying? It's anti-Semite. It's like, why does Hashem listen to these Jews? Why does Hashem do anything for them? You mean, he just gave him this Torah... He makes the miracles, all the big nations wanted to destroy them, the Nazis, the Romans, the Greeks, the Turks, the Spaniards, who didn't want to destroy them? And they survived, out, outlived everybody. For what? And he sees, he looks up, he, just, he sees the pillar also. He goes, ah, why does Hashem make all these miracles? Miki Amcha Yisrael, who's like you, Am Yisrael? You're doing all these things for Hashem. You do these specific incense offering. That no other nation is doing this for Hashem. No other nation gives Kolbano to Hashem. No other nation prays to Hashem like he said to pray to it. No other nation eats kosher like you eat. No other nation lays tefillin like you lay tefillin. No other nation keeps Shabbat like, keeps, you know, like you do. No other nation keeps 620 mitzvot like you do. No other nation studies this Torah like you do. That's why he makes miracles for them. So he helped Kiddush Hashem now. When the Goim see why Hashem is doing good things for Am Yisrael, it's Kiddush Hashem. So now we see from here, from these three things, we understand why this incense offering is important. But still, it doesn't answer why Chayav Mita if you ruin it. And not saying that you're not going to do it at all. I'm saying if, according to Rabbi Natan Rabbi Yehuda, it says, not if you don't give, put any incense offering. It says, if you just put less than what it's supposed to be. The Ramban says that if someone made a mistake with the incense offering, and it wasn't a precise amount, exactly like it says to say, exact quantity, exact order, exact, precise, how we got it from Mount Sinai, it would become Esh Zara, meaning a foreign fire. What's a foreign fire? It's a fire, but there's no pillar. 
So now what happens when there's no pillar of smoke? Let's see. Same three people. The first one that had emunah problems because of Shlombai, because of Panasa, because of this, because of that. He looks up. He sees nothing. There's no pillar. So what happens? He gets even, he's like, he thinks he's alone. He leaves the camp. He becomes like the number two guy. The second guy already left the camp because he had machloket. He turns around. What does he see? He doesn't see nothing. All he sees is the guys that he got into a fight with. He goes, oh, that's the reason why I left. So he continues leaving. You end up le- losing a Jew forever, chas v'shalom. Instead of doing kiruv, he left now. And the third one, the goy, he says, why is Hashem making all these miracles for the Jews? He looks up. He also sees nothing. He goes, what did they do that we don't do? Maybe Hashem made a mistake. Maybe there is no Hashem chas v'shalom. What does that turn out to be? That's Chilul Hashem. <laughs> and for Chilul Hashem, Alakha is Chayav Mita, death penalty. That's why Rabbi Natan and Rabbi Yehuda say, if you miss on one ingredient, you have to understand the consequences. It's not the ingredient that we care about. It's not even the fire that we care about. It's those three people that you end up ruining their life. Because you didn't pay attention to the halacha. Because you thought that maybe your baseball game is more important. You thought that maybe your opinion is more important. You thought maybe you could do it better than perkei avot. You understand? That's the significance of the small mitzvah. Hashem reminding us of it every single day in our prayer. Every day. And everybody reads it. Nobody knows what's going on. Read it one time, two times, three, fifty 50 times. A week. They read it. They have no idea what's going on. Hashem is reminding you. If you're a Jew, you have to be a light to the nations. You have to be that pillar. You're either going to be a Kiddush Hashem, or you're going to be a Chilul Hashem. Bezat Hashem, we all live Torah, love Torah, and end up being Kiddush Hashem. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.